So um, I'll begin by introducing the York International team. We have Eugene Lee, which is our International Student Experience Coordinator for the Orientation and Transition Portfolio. Um, as I mentioned before, I am Anika Black, and I also have my colleagues, Gaga and Sara, who are both student coordinators here at York International. So by the end of this webinar, we hope that you guys will be able to have more knowledge on the course enrollment process at York University, um, some faculty specific course enrollment processes, and a few important considerations to think about when you are building your academic timetable. So in terms of the agenda for today, we will have an introduction to the different faculty breakout rooms, and then you guys will be able to join those breakout rooms. And then finally, we'll discuss a little bit about um, a few pre-arrival webinars that we have coming up. So just some instructions for the breakout room, for the faculty breakout rooms. So the screen is gonna show um, the different faculties that are that we're that we'll be facilitating so we just ask that you join your faculty and then after the breakout rooms are done you'll come back to the main room by about 10 25 and then we'll be going over our upcoming pre-arrival webinars so in these faculty break rooms you'll be able to ask questions and basically engage with the faculty advisors all right <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, so welcome once again to York University and to the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change. Congratulations on being accepted and uh, we're excited to have you join us in the winter. Um, so today we're going to be um, just running through what you need in order to be successful starting in January 2024, um, how to build your timetable. There it is. All right, um, so as I said, um, so we're gonna go through how to enroll in courses, what courses to, en to enroll in, and um, we're gonna show you the visual schedule builder and what a class schedule looks like. So uh, first off, it's important to know um, what program you belong to. Uh, so there's five different programs that we offer here at EUC. We have Cities Regions Planning, Sustainable Environmental Management, Environmental Arts and Justice, um, a joint program with Fleming College and Global Geography. So um, what courses to enroll in? Um, so we're, I'm just gonna use sustainable environmental management as an example, um, but most of these courses um, are universal for um, the programs. Um, so for the most part, regardless of what program you're in, um, you will be taking these courses. So we have ENVS 1010, ENVS 1100, Geography 1000, Geography 1401, Geography 1402, ENVS 1500, uh, ENVS 1400, and then you have free electives, six of those, uh, six credits. So that's either one uh, full year course, or that is two uh, three credit courses. So uh, three credit course is um, one semester, so it's either a fall term, um, a September, or for you guys, it would be in the winter, so it would be January to April. And if you um, haven't received a checklist of your courses that you need um, for your program, uh, you can contact your academic advisor. Um, at eucadvise at urq.ca and include your full name and student number in the email. So I'm um, going to show you um, the visual schedule builder. Um, and basically this tool helps you build your timetable, makes uh, helps you see how your schedule is going to look like. But it's important to note that this does not enroll you in the classes. Um, I will show you how you can enroll in classes afterwards, um, but this just basically gives you a visual um, at what your schedule is gonna look like. So I'm just gonna stop sharing and then go to 
Oops. Oh, goodness. There we go. So in order to access the visual schedule builder, um, if you go to York's website, that's just yorku.ca and click on this magnifying glass. Um, anything that you need to find on the York website um, is just easier to type it into this. Um, so I'm just gonna type in visual schedule builder. And then I'm gonna click this first one. And also on this website, there is a video of how to use the Visual Schedule Builder. So if you wanna go back and watch that, you can do so. Uh, and you're gonna click on this red button using the, it says use the Visual Schedule Builder. And then you're going to log in with your Passport York. And it's going to prompt you not that it's going to prompt you for um, the uh, two factor authentication and that's uh, through Duo Mobile, which is going to be on your phone. So I'm going to click on fall winter 2023 here. Um, you don't need to uh, select your desired course location. Um, but for example, if I just wanted at Kiel. And then I'm gonna type in one of the courses. So I'm gonna do ENVS 1010. And that's a three credit course. Um, so as you can see, it's in the fall, but there is also, so when you're here on the visual schedule builder, uh, you can, um, you can choose certain terms. So for uh, the, you who are coming in uh, the winter, you can choose specifically the winter term and it'll show you here what time and what day the class is happening. So for example, this one, this option, um, it is full as you can see here, um, but let's see, yeah. So the only available option is um, this one, Tutorial 7. So one, one thing to note is that the lectures are going to be um, at a specific time. It does not change. It is, um, everybody's in that one class. So as you can see, the lecture here is on Mondays from 8.30 to 10.30, but it is fully online um, synchronously. So it's happening at that specific time through Zoom. But the tutorial, if I were to change the different times, as you can see, it changes. Um, the tutorials vary. They have different times, possibly different days. So this one that's available is happening on Thursdays from 1030 to 1130. Um, yeah, and I'm just going to, if you click on the class like that, um, it'll pin it. So when you type in more classes, it doesn't move around. I'm then going to type in ENVS 1100. And this one, I'm also gonna, okay, it's only in the winter. The available one is um, the tutorial, is tutorial six, and it happens 12.30 to 1.30 on Tuesdays. Um, but the lectures happen on Fridays from 2.30 to 4.30. And as you can see here, it has the specific location that it's in. So your tutorial is going to be in the HNES building, which is the Health, Nursing and Environmental Studies building. Um, and it's going to be in the basement, uh, whereas the lecture is going to be in the Datalade building. Um, I'm, I have a feeling that you're gonna have some sort of session um, on um, looking at the, the campus um, and you will 100% end up getting a map of some kind um, so that you can figure out where your classes are. Uh, yeah. 
and I'm just gonna actually go down here. Um, and here you can see the catalog numbers. So these are what you're going to use to enroll in the class. Um, in a moment, I'm gonna show you how to actually enroll in a class, but essentially you, I recommend you just copy and paste this. Don't just type it in um, so that you get the exact um, catalog number and that's going to enroll you. Um, if if you take a look at the catalog numbers for a second, I'm going to change the tutorial of ENBS 1100. And as you can see, so this is the catalog number for 1100. If you change the tutorial, the last number changes. So the catalog number is very important because it enrolls you in the specific tutorial that you are enrolling in and that's available. If you were to accidentally do this one, it would not enroll you in it because it's full. Um, so yeah, I recommend you just copy and paste these. Next, I'm going to do Geography 1000. Now Geography 1000 is a full year course. So I don't believe you are able to enroll in that um, as a um, incoming winter student, but um, starting fall 2024, um, you can enroll in that. Um, and as you can see, it happens all year. And again, you can you can move it around and change where your tutorial is, what time, what day, excuse me, whatever ha whatever works with your schedule. Um, I'm also going to put in Geography 1401. This one only happens in the fall. Um, so again, you can enroll in this um, in fall 2024. So I'm just gonna remove that. I believe Geography 1402, however, oh. So if this pops up, um, that just means um, there is a conflict, uh, meaning that possibly this course is happening at the same time as another course and you can't enroll in it. Um, and that's what's so great about the Visual Schedule Builder is that you can see what classes conflict with each other and if it fits with your schedule. So clearly Geography 1402 doesn't um, fit with these other courses. Um, so again, you can enroll in it um, in the um, following term or um, let's see. Yeah, you can play around with the Visual Schedule Builder and see. Um, so now I'm going to show you how to enroll, like actually enroll in a class. So I'm going to enroll in ENVS 1010 uh, for tutorial seven. So that's this first catalog number. I'm going to copy. And the link is right here um, to enroll. You can also access this, I believe, through my online services, which is, um, it's gonna be your best friend for your entire time at York. It has links to everything that you need to access from um, academic stuff, um, how to access your class schedule, um, financial services, a whole bunch of things, um, which, I'm not sure if I'll be going through it today. Um, if we have time, possibly. Um, if not, then I'm sure you're gonna get to it to, in another webinar. So I'm going to just click on that and it's gonna send you to the registration and enrollment page. And you're going to click on uh, fall, winter 2023, 2024 undergraduate students. And then I'm going to, you're going to go to add a course and you're going to paste that catalog number and click add course. Um, 
there might be something here saying like there's been a change made to the course you're trying to add. Um, that usually just means that possibly a room, it was changed to a different room, maybe different time, something like that. Um, so it's good to just double check um, to see if that works with your schedule and you click yes. And then it says the course has been successfully added. If it's um, conflicting or it, the tutorial is full, here it will say the course has not been added. Um, so it's important to read everything that's on the screen. And you just continue. And there you go, you're now enrolled in that class. If um, for some reason you're like, you start the first week and you're like, this course is not for me. Um, I I don't like it. I want to um, drop the course. All you have to do is click drop a course and you're going to click on that specific course that you want to drop, drop course. And there you go, the course has been successfully dropped. Um, I believe that is it. I'm gonna, is this the shortened? Yeah, um, I don't know if you're able to, Tashinga and Bright, if you're able to ask questions, but uh, we've got some, some extra time. So if you want mm -hmm. to ask any questions and you're able to, please feel free. Feel free to type in the chat, um, take off your mic. Yeah. Yeah, Bright, you had a question? Yes, yes. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I wanted to verify, um, how do I know my courses so that I will know which one to enroll and which one to drop or anything like that? Um, so on the academic calendars, it's going to tell you uh, a list of the courses that that you need to fulfill your program. Um, the only thing about it is it's not, it may not be structured year by year. So you might see um, a list of 1000 level courses with 2000 level, 3000, 4000 level. Um, the academic calendar can be a little hard to understand, but as long as you know that you're only supposed to enroll in those 1000 level courses since you're in first year or if you're in first year, um, just look for those 1000 level courses. Those are the ones you need to enroll in. Um, and the safest way I would say is to actually contact your academic advisor. Um, so send an email to uh, eucadvise at yorku.ca. It's the first message I sent in the chat there. Um, and that'll get you in contact with Denise um, or Pip, and they're gonna send you a checklist uh, that's specific to your program. And that checklist is actually gonna tell you year one, these are the courses you take, year two, you take these courses, so on and so forth. Um, and it's a lot easier to follow that way. Uh, so please contact the, the academic advisor um, right away. Just put your full name and uh, student number. Um, and I see you've asked for the email. So let me just type it in the chat one more time. So it's ecadvise at yorku.ca. Um, just remember, put your full name um, and student number either in the email or in the subject line. I believe they prefer it in the subject line just so that they can identify you uh, faster. Um, and yeah, and you should be here back from them relatively quickly. Uh, and then you'll be able to enroll in your courses from there. Hope that helps. Any other questions at all? Even if you have general questions, that's that's Thank okay you. too. Yeah, no problem. All good. Okay, okay. awesome. Uh, so yeah, once again, welcome. I hope you're you're excited uh, to join. We're excited to have you join us here at EUC, um, and we look forward to seeing you around. Um, and if you need any help at all, we are the peer mentors. Uh, if you need to contact a peer mentor, you can let the advisor know. They'll give you our email. Um, and yeah, well, we can be in touch. Uh, so I guess that's all. I don't know if we just return back to the room, but... I'm not sure. Maybe we just... Maybe we'll just leave this room open um, in case there are any other questions. Uh, if anything comes up at all, we'll be here. So just feel free to type in the chat, come on the mic. Um, and yeah, so we'll just sit tight until we are called back to the room. Okay. I'm going to and, end the recording. And, okay, sorry. I wanted to know, yeah. um, do we have a deadline? For, a deadline, a deadline for, for the course registration? For the course registration. 
so for your since you're coming in in the winter um i mean really there's technically there's no like deadline you can join the courses whenever you really wanted to um of course it, there might be a point where it's too late um i would say to make sure you enroll in your courses as long as your enrollment window is open uh make sure you enroll in your courses within two weeks of of courses starting uh in january um so courses begin january 8th i believe um and so of course if you want to be there for the full course for the full duration of the course just make sure you're enrolled before january 8th um but technically you can enroll in a course if you didn't like a course and you dropped in you had to add another course technically you would be able to add um another course a bit later on in the semester but that's uh that's just sort of a preference between the courses that you need to take. Um, yeah. First off, have you um, accepted your offer of admission? Awesome. Okay, cool. Um, have you booked your enrollment appointment? Awesome. Okay, cool. Great. Okay. So um, we'll probably be seeing you shortly then um, for your enrollment appointment because I think they're coming up. So that's good. Um, have you created your Passport York account, your student login information? Wow. Okay. You're on the ball. Awesome. Um, and then have you done your Duo Mobile as well? Okay, cool. Um, and the security questions when you set up the Passport York? Okay, uh, what about the French assessment? Oh, okay. Um, thanks for letting me know. So do you, is your French assessment, do you think it's still like accurate? Have you done any more or less French? You don't have to do it again unless you feel like your French level has changed. So if you like spent some time in a Francophone community or if you've taken courses um, since then, or if you haven't done any French at all and you're worried that your French has gone down. Okay, so yeah, I mean, it's up to you if you think that your French level is still accurate. Like if you think it's still around the same place that it was when you wrote the test originally, then it's still accurate. Um, the only reason I would say to rewrite it is if something's changed with your French knowledge since you wrote the test originally. Um, what program are you going into? Psychology. Okay, cool. So yeah, most of your um, enrollments for the winter are going to be taken up by psychology courses. Um, so you're probably just going to be looking at your, your psych requirements and your French. Um, are you looking, are you doing the BA or the BSC? BA. Okay. And do you want the bilingual degree? Like you want to keep going with French or do you just want to do like the minimum? Bilingual. Okay. Yeah. Most students do the bilingual degree. Um, so that would make sense. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, so you would probably be enrolling just in your psychology and your French courses, which we'll help you out with at the enrollment appointment. Um, have you, what's the, the difference between the, the bilingual and the uh, flexible language is the amount of French you do and the degree you get at the end. So depending on your French level, like if you're kind of a beginner in French, um, then it could potentially take you all four years to reach the bilingual requirement. 
um, which would just be like one French course per semester until you graduate. And then you would get a bilingual degree. So English and French with your degree title staying bilingual in it. Um, if you don't want to do that much French, um, then some people who are beginners in French will just take sort of introductory courses for one year. Um, and then you can still graduate from Glendon, but you wouldn't get a bilingual degree. Um, you would get the just the BA. There would be no bilingual designation and the diploma would only be written in English. So it's not something you have to decide right now. It's something you can kind of feel out this first semester or two. Um, see how you like the French courses. If you want to continue with them, then you're already in the bilingual BA, so you just keep going. Um, it depends on what you want to do. If uh, French is something that's important to you, if it's something that you enjoy, or if you want to like stay in Canada and work in Canada, um, then I would probably recommend the bilingual degree. If you're not planning on staying here, or if you really don't end up enjoying your French courses and it's going to drag your GPA down, then you might want to consider the, the non-bilingual version. Um, but being able to back up like on your resume, if you can put English and French fluent in both, then that really helps you with job prospects in Canada. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, were you able to access your student email account? Mm -hmm. I know you said that you you were deferred and that you did everything, but I just want to make sure about the email because I know a lot of students don't either know that they have an email address. Okay, perfect. So yeah, a lot of university communication is going to go through here. So just make sure you're checking it every once in a while. That's great. Um, and then you'll have an enrollment appointment to attend, I guess, again. Um, if you, did you attend one in the fall before you deferred, or is this going to be your first time attending one? Second time. Okay. So yeah, I mean, it's still useful to attend because the courses are going to be a little bit different and you're going to be looking specifically for winter term courses. Um, plus, I think the appointments are going to be shorter, like some of them are like one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so it'll still be good for you to attend that and get all of your courses enrolled. Um, have you sorted out like visa stuff? Are you ready to be here for the first day of classes in January? Still working on it, okay. Um, so yeah, uh, the contact for the immigration office at London is here. Um, so I would definitely recommend like staying in touch with them if it gets closer to like December and um, the visa stuff is still not finalized just because if you're not here for the first day of classes, then it starts to get a little bit tricky, um, which I'm sure you know with the deferral. So you wanna try and be here um, as close to the first day of classes as possible so that you start um, on time. And then are you like, getting any funding for your degree, scholarships? Have you looked at any of that student financial profile stuff? No, okay. Um, so there's also the finance email there that you can contact to see about any international student scholarship and awards that are offered. There's also, um, I believe recently, international students are now allowed to do the work study program. So um, as a full-time student, probably more so next year, because I don't know how many of them are winter specific. They're usually year long. But if you wanted to work on campus, um, it is allowed within like the, there's a certain number of hours within the visa um, where you're allowed to do the work study program. So that could potentially help with funding. And then there's also something called a student financial profile that you can complete, um, which you can just Google York student financial profile. 
um, and you can submit that. It's like an online awards hub. So there's a huge list of potential awards listed out um, and you can apply to those. That I'm not sure. You'd have to talk to the recruitment office about the Top Scholar program because they're the ones who run it. Um, that the the program is usually like it's a, a collection of perks that you get. So I'm not sure how many of them would still apply to just the winter term. Um, but the recruitment office would be able to let you know what you still um, have access to. Um, because aside from that, the, the recruitment office. So like I know in the past, it's been like a free gym membership or um, a research position um, or what else did they have? I think one year they had like priority placements and enrollment appointments. Um, so you would have to contact the uh, recruitment office. I can send you the email in the chat because I did not include it in the graphic. Um, but just let them know that you, like you said, you were a top scholar and then you deferred to winter um, and you wanted to know if any of the perks are still available for a winter start, and then they can let you know. Yeah, no worries. Are there any other questions I can help you with? Um, so that would be a question for the housing office. I don't know if, um, like, did you have to reapply for housing or like, was there a way for you to defer your room? Um, cause I think, okay. Yeah. So I would contact the housing office to see, cause I don't know if you would have a room then if it wasn't like moved with your deferral. Um, I can send you their email in the chat as well. I think it's just us. Um, because I think they're the deposit you pay to them. Um, you pay it to them directly, but then it gets credited to your housing fees in your student account. Um. So you would have to contact them to be sure, but I don't think you would have to pay it again unless it was already refunded to you. And then you might need to pay it again in the sense that you need to send them the money, but the money was already given back to you in your student account. Okay, so there's their email. You can contact them and see about um, getting a room for, for January. That. Yeah, no worries. I think we've still got a bit of time. So if you want to chill for a minute and see if you have any more questions, that's totally fine. There's something like it for winter students. I think it's called Frost Week. Let me see if I can find. Okay, I can't find anything right now, but if you contact the Student Affairs Office, they're the ones who would run it. Um, so they can let you know when the information will be available and maybe a bit more about it. Um, so I just sent you their email in the chat as well.
but yeah, usually it's not quite as involved as frosh week um, for September start. Um, but sometimes there are like during the first week of classes, there are some like extracurricular type um, events. Um, so there might be like a field trip of some kind or a movie night. Um, and um, I think there's also a specific orientation day that you would have to attend. Um, but yeah, student affairs will be able to let you know. Yeah, so Glendon does have a cafeteria. Um, that's the only place to get food on campus is the cafeteria. There's also a Tim's, um, like a Tim Hortons. I don't know if you know what a Tim Hortons is. Um, because I think they're mostly Canadian. Um, okay, yeah. So Tim Tim Hortons is like a, a coffee shop. Um, so coffee, tea, hot chocolate, um, and some snacks like pastries. So there's like bagels, uh, and like croissants and stuff. Yeah. Um, so and then at the cafeteria, there's a couple of food stations. Um, so if you do live in residence, then you get a meal plan and the meal plan you can use at the cafeteria, um, at the Tim Hortons or anywhere at Kiel. And there's a free shuttle between the campuses that you can take if you wanted more variety with your food. Um, but at the cafeteria, there's like, there's, um, a rotating, um, food station. So sometimes it's like pasta, sometimes it's, um, Korean food. Sometimes it's tacos. Um, there's also a walk station that's always there. There's a grill station so you can get like burgers and fries and sandwiches. Um, and then there's also like um, a fresh food station. So that menu changes all the time. Um, but they've had like roasted vegetables and like different meats. Um, and there's also pizza. So there, and a salad bar. So there are quite a few options in the cafeteria, um, but there's even more options, obviously, at the Kiel campus. Um, and like I said, there's the free shuttle that goes between. So I know when I was a student, my friends and I picked like one day a week where we would take the shuttle together to Kiel and we would um, eat at one of their restaurants because you could use their the meal plan there as well. Um, I'm not sure what the Kiel Mart is. Um, so you could ask the the YU card office to see, or you could check their website. Hold on, YU card. Um, so that's the YU card office uh website. Um and it would let you know there where you can use the YU card. Um, I know like at the bookstore and stuff, if you load money onto your card, you can use it there. But the meal plan is just for meals. Um, so you wouldn't be able to use it to like buy pens or whatever unless you loaded money onto your flags. <laughs> <laughs> um tricky question so honestly it's not just the snow you would need to prepare for I don't know uh how cold it gets where you're from where where are you coming from Ghana okay um so it's usually is it usually quite warm there yeah. Okay. Um, so the snow is one thing, but the cold is another. So like even right now, the way that ca Canadian weather works is it's like pretty cold in the morning and then it'll warm up by sort of midday and then it'll drop again to really cold. Um, so I'm sure you can find like memes on the internet of like what Canadian weather is like that might help you get a better idea. Um, but I would say dress in layers. 
Um, so you'd want to have, you know, like a sweater that you can put on and take off, maybe like a light sweater and a thicker sweater. Um, you probably won't be, unless you want to be outside, you probably won't have to be outside for too long. London's also a pretty small campus. Um, but like, if you wanted to go out and experience the snow, then you would need like, um, winter clothing, um, which you can probably get from like, um, sport check or like maybe even Walmart. I don't know. Um, like any, any clothing store in Canada, like in Toronto is probably going to sell winter gear. Um, but yeah, I would say dress in layers and, um, gloves and hats. Like you, sometimes you don't think about how cold your hands can get, um, and how easily the heat can escape through your head. Um, so I'd say like, if you have a bag and you can just like put gloves and a hat and maybe a scarf in the bag so that you can have them when you need them, um, then that might be helpful and then shoes having good shoes is important as well like running shoes won't work in the snow because they'll get like completely drenched um even like trying to get winter boots sometimes is difficult because like if you if your feet get too hot in the winter boots then they might end up getting cold so I mean what I do personally is I just have rain boots that I wear like really thick socks in and then that usually tends to be okay for me. And then the, I don't have to have both rain boots and winter boots because another part of it is once it starts to warm up a bit after it snows, the snow starts to melt and then you get slush, which is like kind of dirty, slippery snow. And sometimes ice can hide under it. Um, so step lightly and um, yeah, try and get good footwear um for the weather with like tread um because that is even if you're only walking a short distance the cold might not get you but the slush and the ice might yeah no worries I remember in my first year one of my friends he was from I think he was from Spain um and it was his first time seeing snow and we went out and we like were were in the snow and stuff and he loved it so much it was so crazy seeing someone's first experience of snow so I mean if you can I definitely recommend going out and like trying to make a snowman or something um just for the fun of it I know at Glendon they usually do like a a snow festival in the winter time so that would be something to keep an eye out as well Ready? um okay yeah something something that we do here is like you put maple syrup on ice and you roll it up on a stick mm -hmm. and then you eat the the sort of frozen maple syrup um so they do that here sometimes it's called like a sugar shack um i'm trying to think if there's anything else winter related yeah, it's really nice. <laughs> I love maple syrup. Um, yeah, um, just keep an eye out for like the different events that are being run. Usually they'll send like there's a Glendon newsletter that goes out, um, I think once a week. So that would have any upcoming events. Um, sometimes they also like advertise tutoring services or like financial literacy workshops. Um, so I would definitely say to keep an eye out for the Glendon newsletter. Um, people also put posters up around campus. So you can take a look at like the, the walls to see what's going on. Um, yeah. And if you are living in residence, your Dawn is a really good resource. So sort of like the, the student who's in charge of your residence area, um, like they go through training, it's their job to be there for you. Um, so you can certainly lean on them. I know in my first year, my Dawn 
was a really good resource for me. It was really nice. Like she, I remember she came around on like the first day that we were all settled in with a plate of cookies <laughs> and she gave all of us a cookie and asked us how we were doing and stuff. So, um, and they're, they're upper year students as well. So they've been, um, at Glendon for a little while. Um, so they can also like help you out or like be that first point of contact if you have any questions about like what's going on, um, what what you can do, um, getting involved on campus, like if you wanna join a club or whatever, that's another thing that uh, I think they do during the winter orientation week is they do a clubs fair. So in the cafeteria, they'll have um, a bunch of tables with all of the clubs present to um, let you know what's available at Glendon. And the thing they always say is if there isn't a club that interests you, you can always start your own. Um, there are some logistics involved in that, obviously. You need other people, um, but there you also have access to all of the clubs at the Kiel campus. Um, and there, there's a lot of clubs between the two campuses. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to find something that you enjoy if joining a club is, is something you want to do. Um, yeah. yeah, like there's, there's a dance team, there's an anime club, there's, I think Radio Glendon is still running. So if you wanted like a radio show or something, that's something that you could speak to them about. Um, there's piece by piece where, um, people who like teaching or like working with children go into classrooms and teach, um, anti-bullying curriculums. Um, trying to think of what else there is. There's a drama club. We have a theater on campus. Um, so if you're interested in acting, uh, then... There's, there's, um, they usually put on a show once a year, um, and there's been, there's a fashion club, there was a music ensemble, if you play an instrument or if you sing, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of different things, and then the, the gym on campus as well, um, has a lot of classes, as well as like a weight room. So if you wanted to like do a Zumba class or um, I think they do like recreational sports down there as well. So that's an option. And then there's also the Kiel campus. So there's like intramural sports that you can join at the Kiel campus if that interests you. Um, so at Glendon, the majority of the residence rooms are singles. So um, when I was in residence my first two years, um, I remember feeling like the room was a little bit small, but I think I was kind of spoiled because my room at home was kind of big. Um, but yeah, there it's like it's a bed and a desk and a closet um, and like room for a mini fridge. And that's pretty much it. Um, but for the most part, you're really only in your room to sleep and maybe to study. Um, but the library on campus is really pretty. It's got like really big windows where you can see out into the Rose Garden. Um, so I really liked studying in the library. Um, there's also the Breezeway, which is like a glass enclosed area in the main building where, again, you can see out um, to the outside. Um, the And then like during the day when you're like, hang out with friends and stuff. Um, there's also common rooms for each of the house, each of the residence areas. So there will be like a larger room that has like a TV screen. So you can like hook up your computer. You can also like um, borrow games from your, your Dawn. Sometimes they have like board games and stuff that you can go down to the common room and play. Um, and there's like, a sink and a microwave in the common room as well.
Unlikely. Um, you would only have a roommate if you are in one of the few double rooms. Um, and usually students only get those if they request them. Um, because most of the rooms on campus are just single rooms, um, which is kind of unique to London. Most other places you would have a roommate. Do you have any idea what you want to do with your psychology degree afterwards? Are you just interested in the subject and seeing how things go? Yeah, that's totally fine, especially in your first year. Um, and even like if you do, like even for people who do have an idea of what they want to do in first year, a lot of times it changes by the time they get close to graduation. So that's totally fine. Um, when you do start being able to take more sort of specialized courses in like your third and fourth year, that might help you decide a bit more what you want to do. You can also speak to like a career advisor at the career center and they can help you kind of match your skills and interests to potential jobs. Um, yeah, because especially with psychology, there's a lot of places you could go with it. Like I know, like I did psychology in my undergrad and I'm an academic advisor now. Um, I know a lot of people do psychology and linguistics and then they go into speech and language pathology. Um, some people do psychology in their undergrad and then they go to teach um, like at the primary level. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of different ways that you can go with it and it all depends on like what interests you. Um, and then what kinds of courses you take in your upper years. But for especially the first semester, that's not something you would have to worry about. Um, so I would encourage you to like be open and like take opportunities as they come um, because you never know what's gonna stick for you. Um, so that I can't speak to in terms of personal experience because I didn't do an exchange, but I do have a lot of friends who went on exchange, um, especially people who, well, most of my friends who went on exchange were in the French studies program and then wanting to teach French. So they went on exchange to France. Um, you can, if you want to do an exchange, there's a lot of places that you can go. Like I've seen France is the most popular at London um, because of the French piece, but I've seen people go to Australia. I've seen people go to Korea, um, Germany, lots of different places. So if you are interested in an exchange to a country um, where English is not the first language, I would probably recommend that you take at least an introductory course at some point in the language of the country you want to go to because the Kiel campus does offer multiple languages, whereas London has uh, French and Spanish. Um, we also have um, an indigenous language course and um, I think we, we used to have Catalan. I don't know if we still do, um, which is kind of similar to Spanish. Um, but I know at Kiel they have like, they have Japanese, they have Korean, they have Greek, they have German. Um, yeah, that's totally fine. You're not required to, to learn the language. So if you wanted to learn it on your own before you go, then that's fine too. Um, I just was mentioning it in the sense that like, if you're going to go to another country where English is not the first language, it would probably be helpful to have some knowledge of the language. But yeah, certainly learning it on your own is totally fine. Um, the main thing with the exchange program is you kind of have to, you plan it the year ahead of when you want to go. So most students will do the planning process in their second year and then go on exchange in their third year. Um, and you would have to speak to the chair of your department 
to get course equivalencies if you're looking to get like psychology courses on exchange, for example, counted as psychology major credits here. Um, otherwise, you can just kind of save up your elective credits and take free choice courses while you're on exchange. It's not, again, not something you'd have to worry about right away, but something to start thinking about. Usually in October um, is when they start doing information sessions for exchange. So I would keep an eye out for that uh, next year, um, at least to get the information to see if it's something you do want to do. If you do go on exchange, then there is the option to do the International Bachelor of Arts, um, but that would require a higher level of French as well. So not just the bilingual requirement, but um, an additional few courses in French after that. So it's not required. If you want to go on exchange without the extra French, that's totally fine. But if you want the little I um, in front of your degree title, then you would have to do the additional French as well. And if you're interested in like an international experience without necessarily a full exchange program, there are other options like summer internships abroad or even certain courses. Um, like I know there's uh, a Spanish course in Mexico that happens once a year in the summer. Um, there's also, I think there's a, a teaching English as an international language course that happens in Cuba. Um, so there are different options that way as well. If you wanted um, an international component without necessarily doing a full exchange. Um, and then there are also experiential education options um, like closer within Toronto. Um, so there is an experiential education office that you could also contact if you're interested in like internships, co-ops, um, courses that have um, like a community type component to it. Like I know one of our summer courses is um, like a gardening course. Um, so it's a course for credit. But part of the course is um, actually maintaining the the Glendon Garden, and they were growing like mint and um, sunflowers and I think cherry tomatoes as well. Um, so there's a lot of cool things if if you're willing to look for them. Um, so yeah, like depending on what you want to do, uh, there's probably something some way where you can do it. Um, another resource that you might find interesting is called the Salon Francophone. Um, I can type it into the chat, but it's um, it's like a room on campus that is dedicated for non-French speakers to like have conversations and play games and watch movies with um, Francophone students who are hired as like work study students to work in that um, room. So um, it's like a, a less stressful, <laughs> um, more informal way to kind of practice your French um, and also like meet other people on campus who are in kind of like a similar level of French. Um, I know they do a lot of activities as well. Um, and the center is run by one of the professors. Her name is Usha and she's really awesome. She's really sweet. Um, and she like really wants you to like learn French, um, in a way that's like really encouraging. Um, so yeah, I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, if you have the chance, um, I know they were running like Sometimes they have snacks, sometimes they have um, like, yeah, like movie nights and um, games running. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, what did I like most about being a student at Glendon? I, so I chose Glendon originally because I did French and Spanish in high school and I wanted to keep my languages. 
um, I wanted to study psychology and I did not want to be surrounded by concrete uh, because I really like nature. And I loved how Glendon was surrounded by trees. Um, there's like a river down, down the path um, and I could keep both my languages and there were also small class sizes. So all of those really intrigued me. I did not think I was gonna live in residence originally, but then I ended up really loving residence. Um, and I met, I actually met both my husband and my best friend um, within like the first week <laughs> of being a student here. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. So I really liked, like, even in, like, the springtime, people will study outside, like, under the shade of a tree where there's picnic tables. Um, yeah, I, I really liked the community, I guess you could say, like, the Glendon community. The people who come to Glendon tend to be, um, quite kind and caring. Um, obviously, like, there's all different kinds of people wherever you go. Um, but I found like professors tended to really care because of the smaller class sizes, they got to know you by name. Um, and like, if you were struggling with something, they really wanted you to help. Like um, the, the professor I was talking about, she actually came up to me um, during one of the classes and was like, um, I noticed you like having a little bit of trouble with this specific area, like, please come to my office hours so that we can talk about it. Um, and we did. And like, we still have a relationship to today. Um, and I had a couple of research positions with professors as well. Um, through like the small community, um, I was able to just like approach a prof after a class and be like, I really like enjoy your teaching style. I really enjoy your research. Do you have any positions available? Um, and I actually ended up getting a research position that way um, as well as my thesis supervisor. Um, so yeah, I think it's like, I was able to like build confidence because of those kind responses to things where like, I, I feel like I can ask for things when I want them. Um, and yeah, just being like surrounded by, by trees and stuff was also really nice. And the small campus also helps with like, commuting takes so much out of you, like having to travel far distances to get somewhere. Um, but at Glendon, because it's so small, it's really hard to get lost. Um, and it's, it, you can wake up like a f like five minutes before class and still get there on time. Um, yeah, so I did for the first two years of my undergrad, I lived on campus. And then for my last two years, I actually, I moved in with my now husband. Um, and then I, took most of my upper year courses at the Kiel campus as well, because there were more um, psychology course options there. Um, but for, for the first two years, I kind of like eased my way into university, I guess you could say, because I came from actually quite a large high school, but a small town. Um, so the first couple of years, I was able to like slowly get into like the larger class sizes until like with my third year when I was in a lecture hall with like hundreds of students it wasn't as overwhelming as I feel like it could have been if I started right away first year in that kind of environment um and then yeah like being away from home like I have three siblings so having my own space finally was really nice <laughs> um I was in the wood residence um in the all all uh girls tower um so I don't know I guess I'm kind of biased <laughs> I liked wood residence um 
but I did go to Hilliard a little bit because that's where the food bank is, um, which is available to all students, regardless of like your situation. Um, so I volunteered at the Women in Trans Center and I would use the food bank all the time. Um, and the I had a, a few friends who lived in Hilliard as well. Um, but usually I stayed in the wood residence. Um, I don't think there's too much of a difference between them because really the residence halls are are just like for sleeping. <laughs> um, most of the other stuff, like we would hang out at like Lunic um which is kind of like a self-serve cafe in the basement of the manor um or like we would go out or um just like hang out on campus like in the main building um yeah or we would um, be in the, the common rooms. Like we would have um, Super Bowl parties for a little while. I don't know if you um, are into football at all, like American football. Um, my dad was super into it. So we would just use it as an excuse to eat a lot of pizza and um, hang out in the common room. Oh, um, the thing that I did really enjoy about being in residence, though, was we had like the residence house cup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I would um, survive being tackled by uh, large people. But watching it on screen is fun. Um, yeah, the Residence House Cup is really cool. Um, both years that I lived in residence, we actually won the House Cup, which was really exciting. Um, so the residents, um, each house in the residence, so Wood has like different towers, and so does Hilliard. Um, and each of those is like a team. Um, and there's events throughout the year that you kind of compete in and you can get points for competing in those things or attending different events. Um, and then at the end of the year, there was kind of like an award ceremony. And one of the awards they give out is like the house cup to the team with the highest points. Um, so if like competition is something that um, interests you, I didn't think it was going to, and then I got really competitive by the end of the year. Um, so that's something that happens. There was also the residents um, kind of like coordinating team that you can volunteer to be on. Um, so I did that and I actually got a scholarship out of it as well, um, like a small scholarship. But um, if you like planning and like being involved in what's going on, um, and like event planning and decorating and stuff, then um, if you are in residence, then that's something you might want to speak to your Don about doing, like being more involved with it. Um, I really enjoyed that part too. So um, if you have, you guys are have obviously had an acceptance from the um, York University. So we welcome you to the Faculty of Health. Um, just to let you know, if you have not already accepted your um, admissions, you should go into my file and go ahead and accept that. And also book your online enrollment session through my file as well. It talks about your program requirements, how to enroll and how to register for your courses. And it is not an on-campus appointment, it is an online appointment. And thinking back to my first year, it was very difficult for me to enroll in courses on my own. So I definitely recommend everyone to book this um, online enrollment session so you could get some help with enrollment. So how to book your session. So you're basically going to open my file and then you're gonna select 
book or manage your online enrollment appointment. And you should, when you open the page, you see it looking like um, what I have on the screen here. And then on the side where you have the main page, you go down and you see book or manage my enrollment. Then you're gonna click on advising book or manage. So when you click that, it is going to take you to this page where you're able to book the appointment. And you'll basically see a variety of dates that are available depending on your program and when your booking starts. So what are some things to expect before your online enrollment session? So two days before the session, you're gonna receive two emails. The first email is, a list of courses that you could take in your first year. So if you're a transfer credit student, you'll be able to receive an advising note that talks about the, co the courses that we recommend you to take. And the second email that you'll get is a reminder for this appointment that you have coming up. So the reminder email, it will give you the link that has a bunch of videos and slides that'll help you to go through the enrollment process, just in case you wanna take a look at it on your own. The next thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna go ahead and enroll in your courses. So the registration enrollment module, um, REM for short, this is located on the registrar's office website. So as soon as you open this, the registrar's office website, you're gonna click courses and enrollment, and then you're gonna click add and drop courses. So here you're gonna be able to log in with your passport, your information, which is your, your Q email. And then you're gonna select the fall winter session because that's a session that you guys will be enrolling in. Then just answer a few questions that it'll ask and you'll be able to continue and begin to enroll in your courses. So if you have any questions about enrollment, I encourage you guys to reach out to the Faculty of Health because the advisors there, they are very, very helpful and they're able to help you enroll in your courses. Since you're not here in person, many of you I know are virtual. So it'd be good to email them or if you can give them a call and go to the website and again, just be able to book an appointment because I promise you, you will need the help when you are um, enrolling in your courses because especially because it's your first time, there are a lot of acronyms for you to understand. There are a lot of things about your course going that you are going to need help with. So I was, that was the end of the presentation that I was to share with you guys. So now I'm going to just talk a little bit about, um, I'll just talk a little bit about the Faculty of Health in general, the different programs that they offer, and the support that the Faculty of Health offers. Okay, everyone should be able to share my screen. So if you go into your browser and you type in um, York University Faculty of Health, you're gonna be able to see this website. So this website basically tells you a little bit about, it tells you everything that you need to know about your faculty. It talks about the different programs. So we have global health, health studies, kinesiology, neuroscience, nursing, and psychology as um, the different programs that you could take. So we'll talk a little, we'll talk a little bit about um, global health, I guess. So it just basically covers um, the diseases that you need to know about in the program. It talks about a little bit about border issues and about wealth disparity. And then we have health studies. So health studies talk about the changes that we have in technology and the population and a bit of non-clinical health profession stuff. And then it talks about the digital health. Then we have kinesiology. And if you know, um, if you guys have ever taken any health science course in high school, you know that kinesiology has to do with human movement and the relationship between physical activity and health. And then we have psychology, which is my program that is an amazing program. And, um, but let me ask, is anyone here enrolled in psychology? You could just like raise your hand. Perfect, psychology is amazing. 
is the best program. Well, I'm, I'm biased because it's my program, but it is a pretty good program. So it just helps you to learn about um, study of the mind and behavior and stuff. It's really interesting. And even if you don't end up taking psychology, you could always take courses um, outside of that just to get to know a little bit more. And then we have neuroscience, which is similar to psychology, but it focuses more on the brain and um, how your nervous system works. And then we have our nursing program, which is also part of the Faculty of Health. Okay, so another thing I wanted to tell you guys is that um, it's just a little bit about the different academic um, resources that are available to you as a student um, under the Faculty of Health. So if you go to the Students tab and you click Academic Resources, you will see this page and it basically tells you about the different things that we have. So I'm going to do Academic Support Resources in the Faculty of Health and it'll take you to this page. So basically, you're, when you enroll in your courses and you're building your timetable, you're going to receive a course outline. The course outline doesn't usually come out until most professors post it, I would say about a week or two after, um, a week or two before school opens, they usually post these course outlines. So in your course outline, it basically tells you everything about your course, the different evaluations that you're going to have, the assignments, it talks a lot about office hours and usually outlines all the chapters that you're gonna to need to read each week for class. So this is a really important document that I would, and most professors, are, um, it's mandatory for you to read it. So it's a really, really important document that you guys should keep a lookout for. And then we have our course directors and our instructors. So those will be like your professors, you can book appointments with them, you have teaching assistants and their information will be in the document that I spoke about earlier, which is your course outline. And then we have course representative. So in my first year in university, I was a course representative. And as a course representative, you're basically a liaison between the class and the professor. So a lot of student issues come up. Um, we give students a lot of encouragement. We create PowerPoints and talk about the different things, some things that you guys need to know. Um, we'll do a lot of sessions on how to manage your time and some study groups. So this is a really good um, this is a really good thing that you guys should um, make use of if it's available to you because pretty much every course has um, a course representative. So you guys go like reach out to them, talk with them and then we have our peer mentoring and our peer assisted study sessions. So, these sessions basically, they're for specific courses. I know that a lot of, especially for, I'll speak, I can speak for psychology, mainly because that's my program. They have a lot of um, these sessions. So what it is, is that students who have taken the course before you, students who have taken the course before you, um, they're in their upper year. Oh, so I see you guys have your hands raised. Do you want to ask a question? Or is it from earlier? I can't tell. I guess it's not a question. Okay, so I'm gonna pause reading um, from the screen just so I can answer a question in the chat. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about my experience, um, um, too, if I didn't mispronounce your name. So I'm gonna, I could tell you, I could definitely tell you what it was like um, being a first year student at York. So I'll get into it just in a few minutes as soon as um, I finish going through just a few of the points here. So um, as, we're, as I was saying, we have the great tutoring and the past sessions. So these are not always graduate students. Sometimes they're undergraduate students, but like in their fourth year that they basically help to facilitate you in learning the course with different study sessions that happen over a variety of days. And then we have your department and your school advisor, which is the person that you will be um, talking with. And I am highly, highly recommending you guys to talk with your advisors. So everyone, 
when you enter a university, you, you always make an appointment with your academic advisor just to talk through and go over your courses and find out if you're on the right path. What usually happens is that that academic advisor is usually your academic advisor until you end your university. It doesn't always go like that, but most times it does. And it is a really good way to know if you're on track, if you're enrolling in the right courses, if you are getting the right information. So I would definitely recommend everyone checking out this tab that talks about the department and the school advisors. So your GPA requirements, um, all honors programs and regular programs in the Faculty of Health have a certain GPA that you have to maintain and York basically has a lot of resources to help you to maintain your GPA. So when you guys um, start classes, I definitely recommend that you make use of those resources. Then we have the academic services that you could ask questions about your degree, but it's um, at about repeating courses. Then you have academic petitions, which I hope none of you guys ever have to use. Um, but if you want to know about withdrawing from a course that is past the deadline or past the enrollment date, then this is a resource that you will have to um, use, which I, again, I would recommend that you guys pay really close attention, really close attention to any date that you see um, like from your ad job deadline so that you could, you don't have to use these res um, this resource specifically, but it is still there for you. And there is your degree progress report that you could talk about. You could talk to the academic resources and they'll like explain your degree progress report, which basically shows where you are in your degree, the different courses that you need to complete to fulfill um, your degree requirements. And then we have academic honesty, which is very, very important here at York. Um, we all know about chat GPT and plagiarizing. So um, you could actually get into a lot of trouble if you don't um, if you don't use these guidelines for academic honesty. And if you wanna change your program, again, there are resources here that can help you. You don't have to feel like you need to be in one program in order to um, do that. So yeah, so these are basically all the resources that are available to you. And um, that is what I wanted to share with you guys. So I'll go ahead and answer the question that was asked in the chat. So um, my experience, my first year experience at York University. So I am actually a domestic student. However, I've only lived in Canada for two years. I moved from Jamaica um, two years ago to come to York. To, to school. So the hardest thing I would say to adapt to was the weather. That was the hardest thing because I am from, as I said, I'm from Jamaica where it is very hot there. And then in Canada, it is extremely cold. So that was the hardest part of my journey, adapting to the weather. And then adapting to York, in my case, it wasn't very difficult because I did go to college while I was in um, Jamaica. I attended college and college is very, very similar to your university experience. But I didn't have, I didn't attend these webinars that are happening. I didn't attend webinars. I didn't talk with people. So I wasn't aware of the different resources that were available to me. So when it came on to the time to enroll in my courses and build my timetable, I basically only just got an email saying, sign up um, for your courses. And I went through a lot of things to be able to sign up so it was a bit difficult for me because I didn't know about the resources that were available and you guys will notice when you're building your timetable especially that York basically has acronyms for the or they have letters for the different days of the week so that's also something that you guys will need to pay attention to because um, for example if you're going to enroll in a course and beside the course for the day and time, you might, you're going to see the letter R. You're going to think to yourself, I don't know any day of the week that starts with R, but R actually means Thursday. If I'm not lying, it actually means Thursday. So just to say little details like that, I didn't have, I didn't have anyone to like share that information with me, which is why I struggled a bit when I was coming in. But after, um, you get seasoned and you start to take different courses. Um, like for example, I took like Psych 1010, which is, which is Introduction to Psychology, which um, every psychology student is, 
that's a mandatory course. If you don't pass that course, you're not able to enroll in other psychology courses. Um, yeah, so different things like that. It was, so as I said, it was a bit difficult for me. However, um, after I got used to the different resources that are available, it got a lot easier. And psychology is, I know I'm going on and on about psychology, but only because it is my program, but the all the programs here in the Faculty of Health are amazing. But you, you guys have a very unique experience because you're not limited to only taking the courses that are for your major. You have to take courses outside of your major. So you have to do some general education courses and then you have to take some electives. So you get to basically dab a little bit into the different, um, all the different faculties at York anyways, which is, I think is really good because no one wants to only focus on their program, I would say. So yeah, so being in um, psychology is amazing. And my first year again was a bit difficult because I didn't have the support, but once I got the support, then I was able to move on. I hope that answered your question. I know I went on and on and on for a while. Okay, so there's another question. So it says, I have booked an appointment to enroll in my courses on October 24th. Should I book an appointment with an academic advisor before enrolling into my courses? I'm a little bit confused about this. Okay, so this is actually a really good question. Um, so just to sum up, the question is if you should book an appointment with your academic advisor other than your enrollment appointment. So the appointment with your academic advisor is those appointments are usually before you and Role in your courses. Let's say you don't know, you know that you're in the psychology program, but you don't know what exactly, what pro, what courses you want to take. Because other than Psych 1010, you're, as a, as a first year psychology student, or as a first year student in the Faculty of Health in general, you're, you won't be able to take other courses in the faculty if you don't take the minimum, like the base course, which would probably be be a for which is definitely a first year course. So it is good to book with your academic advisor. Just talk with them. If you don't understand what course you need to enroll in, you should definitely talk with them before um, you could do it before your appointment to enroll in your courses because it wouldn't make sense having the appointment to enroll in your courses if you don't know what courses to enroll in. So the academic advisor will definitely, that's what they're there for. They help you, they talk with you, find out what are your goals for the semester and try to basically fit all that into a timetable. So I would definitely say book with an advisor before if you can, um, before um, doing the appointment to enroll in your courses. But again, if it doesn't, if you don't end up getting an appointment, that's completely okay. You could always do it afterwards as well, but before, if that is possible. Um, no problem. So does anyone have any questions about the Faculty of Health or any specific program in the Faculty of Health? I feel like I have shared a lot of information, but um, do you guys, if you guys have any other questions about the faculty? Um, okay, I think the ending of the, okay, what's the GPA to maintain or to get into the honors course? Okay, so I believe for, Okay, so the first question is about what, um, how much GPA, what's your GPA to maintain to get into an honors course? So if you got admitted to York in the honors program, that is really good because you're taking 120 credits. So what happens is the minimum GPA that you have to maintain, I believe is a five because at York it is on a nine point scale. But let me pull it up quickly. I 
Okay, I believe it is a five. But let me know. But it is a five. Okay, so your minimum GPA that you have to um, have is a five for the for um, the honors program. So what happens is that if you uh, GPA of five is honestly it's not very hard to maintain at your because the grading scheme here is a lot different and it's to me it is a lot simpler. So it's not very hard to maintain. So don't let the five scare you. Um, what you, what happens though if you do get less than the five, they usually take you out of the honors program and they will bump you down to just a standard um, a standard program instead of allowing you to take honors because what you guys have to know about the honors program, it's a little bit more, it's, it's a lot harder than, not to scare you, hard probably wasn't the right word to use, but it's uh, it takes a lot more work than just being in a standard program. So if you're not able to maintain the GPA of five, they usually do um, just put you in a regular program if you're not able to manage that. So the other question, hopefully that answered your question. Um, what kind of course does psychology program include? So psychology has a lot of courses. This is like such an exciting question for me. Um, let me see if I could pull up. Okay, so. Okay, so here we have, um, hopefully you guys are able to see my screen. If you're, if you're seeing my screen, give me a thumbs up so that I could make sure. Okay, perfect. So if you type in your Q timetable, just as I did, it'll bring you to this page with, which shows you um, all the different courses that are here, all the different courses. So we're just gonna go to psychology since we were talking about psychology. And so I did fall, winter, psychology, and I'm doing Kiel campus because that's the campus that I am in. So these are all the psychology courses that are available to you. So we have intro to psych, which again, if this, this course is very, very important. The minimum grade that you have to pass is a C. If you don't do if you don't get that in this course, you won't be able to enroll in any of these other courses. So one thing that you will learn in your um when you book your advising appointment, you'll know more about the course codes. So all the codes that starts with a thousand are like first year courses, two thousands are like second year courses, and the three thousands are like third year courses. So um just so I don't get carried away. Um so the courses in the psychology program the very first one would be the intro to psychology that you'll be able to know more. You It's basically an overview of every single course in psychology, social psychology, statistical methods, um, research. And it taught, you learn a lot about clinical psychology, um, motivation, developmental psychology. So those are basically some of the um, different courses that you are able to take. but. Again, if when you take intro to psych, it covers all those courses, just gives you an overview so that the further you go, you'll be able to know more about what other courses they have. But like courses like statistical methods and introduction to research methods, those are mandatory courses if you're in an honors program. Okay, the other question. If I maintain a five GPA, will my honors program start after my third year? Okay, I think I'm, I'm trying to understand the question. If I maintain a GPA of five, will my honors program start after my third year? So your honors programs, if I'm understanding the question correctly, your honors program begins as soon as you start. So you, 
you if you en- you were enrolled in New York, you got your acceptance letter and they gave you the go ahead that okay you're in the honors program, your program already started. Once you maintain the GPA of five, which again not very hard to do, um, you're gonna be in that honors program all the way until you end, and then you could enroll in the specialized honors program but that's mostly for students who want to go to grad school and you want to pursue like research or go in depth in another um go in somewhere in depth in psychology you could enroll in the specialized honors program but that program you have to maintain a gp of seven so it's a little bit harder but to answer your question once you enroll in in new york and you got your acceptance letter and they tell you okay you're enrolled in the honors program then you 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 would have already begun. Hopefully that answered your question because I think that's what I understood from what you asked. And then and then to the person who asked about the different kinds of programs in psychology, hopefully I answered your question and properly as well. Okay, so yeah, I think I answered the question then because your honors program begins as soon as you start university. It starts in your first year. So does anyone have any other questions? It doesn't have to be about psychology, not because I talk about psychology a lot. It doesn't have to be about psychology. It could be about other programs in the Faculty of Health. It could be about your timetable if you have a concern. Could be anything because the webinar is um, directed at building your timetable. So, and just to let you guys know, so as a first year student, especially your first semester, enrolling in courses, um, what it will look like is, I could talk about for for me, I only did one course for my major. So let's say, I'm really sorry for using psychology again as an example, but let's say I'm I enrolled in psychology, right? I was only able to take one single psychology course for my first semester, which is Psych 1010. And then you do 15 credits per semester. So you, you most for most of the faculty of health programs, you'll only be able to do one course in your major. And then outside of your, your other courses will have to be like general education courses and electives. So don't worry too much about not being able to do everything that you wanna do in your first semester and wanting to know more about your program. You will generally get to take only one course just so um, you, cause they're like, it's like a prerequisite for your other courses. So most of the courses that you'll take will be like outside of your major. Um, orientation for the winter semester. Okay, that is a really good question. And so I'm with the orientation agenda. Um, the orientation for the winter semester. Okay, so the, I don't believe the date has been released as yet, but as soon as it is released, you'll definitely get an email. Because we're hosting, we're going to host um, in-person orientation. So as soon as the date is released, you'll get an email about that. That's a good question. You still have about... We still have about 20 minutes. So do you guys have any other questions about the Faculty of Health, about the programs in Faculty of Health? Again, it doesn't have to be psychology. It could be any of the other programs, kinesiology. Um, it could be any of the other programs. And anything related to your timetable.
Okay, can we plan our timings for attending the undergrad, the university undergraduate morning or evening sessions? Um, what exactly do you mean um, by sessions? As in like the courses or like the events? Um, could you let, let me know what exactly you mean by sessions and I'll answer your question. Um, I had a Okay, so the winter break is basically reading week during the winter. We get like a week. Um, we get like a week to basically read, which um, okay, let me tell you the exact dates for that. So reading week in winter begins, it is February 17th to February 23rd. So it's just one week that you get to basically do assignments, catch up on rest. Majority of the, sometimes though, um, since you guys are like first year students, I'll let you know that some professors, they tend to have exams after reading week. Some will do before. So it's like very hard to like plan what you're gonna do in reading week because you never know. Most times you're gonna have all your exams after or sometimes before. But yeah, reading week is February 17th to February 23rd. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, and okay, okay, you meant the classes and the courses. Okay, so yeah, you basically get to, when you're creating your timetable, you get to create your schedule and plan if you want to do morning or evening classes. It's, it's just whenever the courses are available to you. So since I'm already on this website, I'll just use this for example. So let's say I wanna enroll in Introduction to Psychology for the winter semester. So as you could see here, it says term W. So that means for the winter term. And everything that says term W is winter. Term Y is full year, which we're having a webinar next week that we'll talk a lot more about what W and Y and all that. So just the, so to answer your question. So for example, it says term W here and you see that Rebecca, that Dr. Jubis is having her class. Um, okay, let me see what time. I just wanna show you guys the, the time differences because all the courses are like available. Most courses are available at different times. Okay, so so see for the winter term and Dr. Jubis is having her class. She has a class at 2.30, 2.30 on Monday and 2.30 on Wednesday. But then you have Dr. Jenkin, which has her class at 8.30 on Tuesdays and 8.30 on Thursdays. So you plan how you want, you plan what you want your schedule to look like, as long as there are no conflicts. So you get to choose if you feel like you want to do a 2.30 class rather than doing an 8.30 class, that is completely up to you. Some Because some people are not morning people, so they don't want to get up early in the morning. So yeah, you plan what time you want to enroll. You plan what time you want to take your courses. So you could do the 2.30 class or you could do the 8.30 class. And it goes like that for all the programs, all the programs here at York. So you choose the times that you want to attend. So I would say it's very flexible because they try to accommodate you if you, because a lot of students have to, a lot of students work while they come to school. So it's very flexible. You choose how many, you choose what time you want to go to class and as long as there's an enrollment for that, and you choose how many classes you wanna have in a day, um, as long as you're taking the required amount of credits per semester, then you're fine. You basically create your own schedule. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, how many courses are there in a day? So again, this is totally up to you. That's the really amazing thing about university. It is up to you. But you, if you feel like you want to take three classes in a day, you can enroll in three classes in a day. It, there's, there's no set number. The only thing that is set is that you just need to make sure that you're taking the required amount of credits per semester, which at York, it is um, they recommend you to take 30 credits per year, which is 15 credits per semester. And most of the courses are like 
three credits or six credits. So if you want to take one class in a day, you could enroll. Let's say I only want to do, um, I only want to do, I'm doing Psych 1010. I feel like, okay, Mondays and Wednesdays, I only want to have one class. Then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to enroll in this class. And that would be, that could be my only class for Monday. Or if it's going to, it's starting at 2.30. If I feel like, okay, I want to have something at 8.30, then I want to have a break in between, and then I want to have another class. Then you could enroll in other courses. So there's no required amount of courses that you have to take per day. There's no required amount. You set your own schedule. So you determine how many courses you feel like you want to take in a day. Hopefully that answers your question. And that's what makes university like amazing. Um, another question. Okay, so that this is a really good question. So the question was basically, um, can I change my t oh. oh so the question was, can I change my timetable if I cannot attend a class I choose earlier? If you choose a morning class and couldn't attend it, can I enroll for the next available class? Okay, so this is where your your ad drop, your your adding courses, this is where it gets like this is where it gets really important because I you can change a course, but what's gonna happen is you're I, most likely in your um enrollment session, they're going to use something called a visual schedule builder. Let me see if I could pull that up. Okay. Okay, so let me show you what the visual schedule builder look like, looks like. And this is what's going to help you to um, basically create your timetable in a way where you're able to see everything that that is happening so this is what the page looks like for the visual schedule builder um which i'm pretty sure when you're going to enroll in courses they'll go through this so if you you're not able to do a morning class you're able to switch it out however it's important that you again pay attention to what are the deadlines what are the add and drop deadlines? Because sometimes you can't drop a, like in the middle of the semester, you can't just drop a course and there's no penalty. There will be a penalty for just randomly dropping a course in the middle of the semester. So what I would say is when you're using the timetable, when you're creating your timetable, which is something they will go through in the, um, when you book your online session, this is something you should utilize because the visual schedule builder, it, it lets you see what your timetable looks like before you confirm that you want to go in a, to enroll in a course. So it lets you see what your mornings look like, your evenings look like, so that you don't have to drop a course in the middle of the semester. Because again, they, you have like penalties for that. You might not get all your, you might not get all your money back. You might get a, a certain grade on your report card if you drop the course too late. So you can change your timetable if, you want to attend class at a different time, but I would suggest doing that. Now is the time where you'll be able to do that when your enrollment opens and you're looking at your schedule. It's not, I wouldn't advise doing it in the, in the end of the semester, but again, it is flexible if you choose, if you want to, you could, but um, you are allowed to, if you take the 4.30 class and you would realize that, oh, I don't, the 2.30 class, and you realize, oh, I don't like this 2.30 class, you're open to enrolling in the 8.30 class instead. But you have to like be really quick with it because a lot of these classes, they get filled really quickly. So that's another thing you guys will have to look out for. Um, the class is being full and some of them, they, when you're enrolling, it'll say the remaining seats are restricted. So all these little things are things that you have to keep in consideration when you wanna switch courses. Hopefully that answers your question. Those are some really good questions, guys. Thank you so much for asking. If you guys have any other questions. Yeah, so this is like, personally, I don't use the Visual Schedule Builder. I use um, my time table. I'll give you guys an example of what um, a timetable looks like. 
uh, I'll probably show you my timetable. I'll show you guys an example, just so you could, since the webinar is about your timetable. Um, so I don't, I, I don't use the Visual Schedule Builder. I use Plot My Timetable instead. So what happens is when I enroll in my courses, I open this um, page. Okay, so I'll show you guys for fall. So typically, this is what uh, a, a timetable would look like. This is what my timetable looks like, but it's different for me because I'm in my second year. So it's a, it's a little bit different. So basically for the question that was asked about how, how many classes you take a day, as you could see here, my Mondays, I only have two classes and this is a tutorial. It's not, an, it's a tutorial, so it's not a lecture. And then I have another class here and then my Tuesdays are like this and then my Wednesdays and my Thursdays, my Fridays, I don't have a class. So this is typically what a timetable would look like, what your timetable would look like um, when you start to do the enrollment and you start to go through everything. I wish I could show you guys what my first year timetable looked like, but I don't think they're gonna, they're not allowing me to open that. But yeah, this is typically what, um, when you're done enrolling in your courses, this is really what you will be able to see after. So this is fall semester and this is winter. And because the winter is a little bit colder, people, a lot of, because it, not a little bit, the winter is very cold. People don't usually, students don't usually enroll in like, early morning classes because it's very hard to be up so early in the cold but I don't mind but yeah so this is what like what my fall what my winter timetable looks like as you can see I don't have classes on Fridays Thursdays I only have one class Wednesdays two classes Mondays Tuesdays two classes so this is typically what um, a timetable would look like um, when you're coming when you are done um, enrolling in your courses. And this is a good place to look when you enroll in your course. So you're, you're able to see if you have any conflicts because what if you enroll in two classes that begin at the same time, right? Um, this is somewhere you'd go to be able to see that. And once you see that, you're able to um, remove yourself from one of the courses or try to fix it in a way. So the other question. Does York University have a direct subway station so students traveling can easily attend the university? So yes, York University does have a direct subway. So our subway is called York University. Um, that's our subway station. So whatever direction you take the, the subway from, it you could get off at two stations. So York University, I would say, actually has two stations. So it has York University station and there's also a station called Pioneer, Pioneer Village. So you could get off at any of those two stations. It just depends on like where you have your class. So if you have your classes, um, well, you guys aren't on the campus yet, so you might not be able to visualize this, but just know that depending on where you have your class, you could get off at any of those two subway stations because they're both on the campus. Thank you for that question. Do you guys have any other questions? And I showed you what my timetable looks like. So you guys would know that when you're enrolling, um, it'll, this is typically, again, I'm in my second year. So this, but it is pretty much, is pretty much very similar. If you're a first year, your first semester, it's really similar because you're only gonna be doing, if it's 15 credits, um, you're only, chances are you're probably only going to be taking like three courses or so because some courses are like six credits, some courses are three credits. Um, so yeah, a lot of things vary with um, what your timetable would look like in the end. So this is, this page, you, you guys will be like utilizing this page a lot when you're um, creating your timetable. Because as you can see at the side, it shows you the subject, it shows you all the different courses, the terms, and your general education courses. It shows you your exam schedule, basically it shows you everything.
Okay, so there's another question that says, um, what's your overall experience staying at Canada in your first year, food, meals, on campus staying? So I don't, I actually don't live on campus. I live off campus, so that part might vary. Um, but I do believe you have a library coming up that talks about um, living on campus. So living in Canada, again, for me, it was difficult because of the weather, mainly the weather. But transportation and everything is like very effective here. Um, so my first year, I don't know if my experience would be valid since I don't live on campus. So is it that you want me to, would you still want to hear what it is like? Given that I didn't live on campus, I live off campus with my parents. So, okay, yeah, so it might not be valid. But living, I could tell you a little bit, a little bit about living on campus. So living on campus in your first year, what, okay, so if I live on, I'll just say if I lived on campus in my first year. So living on campus in your first year, in terms of like food and meals, so depending on where you choose to live, there are a lot of different residences here at York. So there's on-campus residents and there's off, there's residents like that, are affiliated with different colleges at York, like the Thune, Founders, all those colleges. Um, living in those residents, like you have to have a meal plan, which is something that you have to like pay separate for other outside of your housing. You have to pay for a meal plan that you're basically able to buy different, um, buy food at the cafeteria or any of the restaurants around York. Because all the restaurants here, use the meal plan so that's typically what your first year would look like if you live on campus you'll have a meal plan if you choose to stay at one of the colleges if you choose to do like private housing which is like pond you don't have to have a meal plan you can make your own meals you can make your own meals you don't have to have a meal plan if you live there um it really depends on how you look at it because I mean, York does have a lot of different restaurants, but when you weigh the the benefits of having the meal plan, you know if you want to take it. But again, for the colleges, it is mandatory that you have that meal plan. Just basically allows you to get buy breakfast, lunch, dinner at the different um, cafeterias and the different restaurants here at York. New York has a lot of restaurants. They have a lot of restaurants both on campus and a little bit off campus too. So that's typically what your first year would look like in terms of what you would eat. Hopefully that answers your question. And again, seeing Canada, um, there will be a webinar that I will talk a lot more about it next week, living here in your first year, because the title of the webinar is your, my first year at York. So you guys should definitely register for that if you want to know more about what it is, what your first year would be like, because I'll talk a lot about that. Um, but yeah, your first year, especially because you're coming in the winter semester, I don't want to scare you guys, but please come prepared with um, whether that is you're going to come here and you're going to get the weather, the, the, the winter gear, or you're going to take winter gear from home, just come prepared because it's going to be very cold. In order to get your YU card, what should we do after visiting the university? So I believe that there are two ways that you could get your YU card. Um, you could either sign up online and take your own picture and submit the picture online and they'll then you pick it up at the office. They'll let you know when it's ready. Or when you come to York, you could go to the office. And when you go to the office, they'll take your picture and then they'll give you the YU card there. So in order to get it, I you have to go to the office. The office is in a building that is called William Small Center, which this is probably, you guys will be here for a while. So you, hopefully you will still remember though. But I think they like send you a reminder to pick it up and they send you the location. But when once you come to the university, you'll go to the William Small Center because the YU card office is there and that's how you'd be able to get your YU card. And I, now like technology is like so amazing because when I just started, we didn't have, our YU cards were like, they're like physical cards. 
your physical card. So like, for example, this would be my YU card, um, but now you could have it on your phone. So that's, a, that's like amazing. So that's amazing. Um, what are the benefits of the YU card? So your YU card is mandatory. It's, it's your ID card. It's not something you choose to have. You have to have it because for you to, again, enroll in courses, you need that number. I believe you guys already have your student number. Your YU card has your student number printed on it. You need that for every exam. Every exam that you do at your university, you need to, you're going to have to take your YU card with you because it's your ID card. It has your, and it has your um, number. It has your student number on it. So it is like mandatory for you to have. So there aren't really benefits per se because it's a mandatory card. You need it to do everything. You need it for printing. Oh, one thing that I would say is really cool with it, your YU card, if, if you put money directly on the card and you buy stuff at the bookstore, at your university's bookstore, you get points. So I think that that'll be a benefit. You get to get points if you buy stuff. Um, on the at the bookstore and when you collect enough points you like get money off and you could use your you use your yu card for printing for your printing services at the library or anywhere on campus that does printing they typically they really only take a yu card for that so you like top it up with money and you'll use it for that because i don't live on campus i really only use my yu card for just my exams. But if you live on campus, that's what you're gonna use to pay. That's what your meal plan is on. So you'll use it a lot more. Do you guys have any other questions? Thank you so much for that question, by the way. It was really good. I'm trying to think if, I think I pretty much, I went through a lot that has to do with building your timetable and that has to do with the Faculty of Health. I did talk a lot about psychology, but only because you guys didn't ask me about the other programs. Um, but if you do want to know about any other programs, please go ahead and ask. Anything about your timetable that you're not sure of? Anything that has to do with enrolling in your courses that you guys are not sure of? We still have 20 more minutes before we go back to the main room. Okay, so the other question, after we complete each course, will we receive these 15 credits? So yeah, um, there is this thing on your, so if you type in degree progress report your university, it'll take you to this website, at your degree progress report. Oh God. Okay, I won't open it because it's probably gonna show mine, but if you type in degree progress report, your university and you open this page. It takes you to your degree, to basically where you are in your degree, the things that you have left to do and your credits. So your credits are there. Once you enroll in the courses, it pops up on the degree progress report that, okay, three, um, let's say, okay, psych 1010, three um, credits, but it says potential credits. So you get the credits, they're there on your report as potential. And then if you pass the course when you're done, they grant you the credits. Hopefully that answered your question. Um, when can we create our timetable and enrollment classes? So your enrollment, it depends on what your enrollment window is. Cause I believe for every, for every student, not for every student, for every program, it is slightly different because you're, but what you should definitely check is um, my file. 
it will tell you when you should enroll in your course. Okay, so this is not the, but um, your register, but but your my file tells you your enroll your course enrollment date. So basically, when en your enrollment window opens, it's so it is. But I think it's back on this specifically. And when you enroll in your courses, that's when you'll be able to create your timetable. So that's what I, I won't be able to give you the exact date because as I said, it varies and that's something that you have to look for on your my file. But I'll give you a, a quick um, thing. This was Mm -hmm. So when you, when you, um, when you look up, when you do going to your my file, that's where you'll be able to see when, what your enrollment date is. And then based on your enrollment date, you just, oh yeah, something that I forgot to mention is really important. Um, the t enrollment time, honestly, if you guys can enroll in your courses at the time that it says to enroll like for example let's say it says october 18th at 10 a.m get on that website at 10 a.m because what what is likely to happen because everyone's doing what you're doing everyone's enrolling in courses the seats get filled up really quickly and if you don't get into a course that you want to get into you might have to like email the professor asking them to let you in or emailing the department asking them to give you permission to enroll in the course so just i didn't stray from your question just so that you know you create your timetable when you enroll in your courses and you enroll in your courses when the enrollment period begins which is in your my file but is specific to everyone so i'm not able to um access to basically i don't have access to that hopefully that was a good answer so yeah um that's how that's a that's what you guys need to know about enrollment. And then there is something else I wanted to show you guys. Okay, so if you go to this page, which is the registrar's office, and then you click enroll in courses, um, and the enrollment registration guide, and you scroll all the way down. Okay, so as you can see here, it says find out when to enroll. Here it says you have a signed date and time to begin your enrollment process. So this is where you, you'd find out what your exact date and your exact time is. Okay, I booked my appointment for enrolling to courses on October 24th at 9 a.m. Is it according to the time in Canada? Yes, it is according to the time in Canada. So as you can see here, it says the date and time are the set Eastern time zone used in Toronto. So that's something that you guys should definitely remember it is Canadian time and not the time of the country that you're in because when you miss these times again the classes get filled up you might not get to enroll in a course that you want to enroll in but what I would say since that you guys are in your first year if you guys want you could even you could go to the course list and I know that you have to take a lot of students have to take general education courses depending on their faculty. So if your faculty requires general education courses, you could go to, okay. If you go to the course website, If you go to the course website that I showed you, 
um, and you go to general education courses, this is a good way to be ahead. This was one of the things that I wish I did. Okay, so you're gonna go to, oh, sorry. So it's fall, winter, and then faculty of health. And then let's say you're doing a bachelor's of arts, you'd click bachelor's of arts and Keel because it's the Keel campus, if you're going to the Keel campus and then you search. So these are basically general education courses, right? These courses, I can, I'm speaking for psychology because I know they're mandatory. It's mandatory for you to take a general education course. Take, you have to take about nine, six of them, I think, covering like 30 credits in total. So, one thing that I would say you guys can do is check out this website. Look at the courses. You don't have to wait until your enrollment date. Look at the courses. Read, read what they are about so that you could like have an idea of what you would want to do. Again, for, for faculty of health, I think you have to take humanities course and one from humanity, one from social science, and a few from natural science depending on your your um, program but read read the courses see what they're about and so you can know what you want to do before you so that you don't use your entire enrollment window trying to figure your enrollment time trying to figure out what course do you want to enroll in you know hopefully that made sense so just like go through this page that talks about the general education courses because it's mandatory for most students in the faculty of health. And then just find out, just see what you like and like know what you want to do so that as soon as your window opens, you could go ahead and enroll. Okay. Um, okay. Another question says, simply true program in Bachelor's of Arts Psychology, I should sign up or more courses, 120 credits, when compared to the ones that didn't choose programs, 90 credits. Okay, so the the difference between the 120 credit and the 90 credit is that for 120 credits, you're an honor student. You're in the honors program. So you'd be in the, um, psych on, you'd be doing a honors bachelor's of arts. But if you just do the 90, um, if you just do 90, credits then you're you would be in just a bachelor's of arts so just so that you know 120 credits it doesn't mean you're signing up for you're doing 120 credits over the four-year period that you're here at york so it's not one don't try to in my first year i actually thought that i needed to have 120 credits for my first semester so just imagine the stress that i went through trying to enroll in 120 credits for one semester. It is impossible, by the way, but because I didn't have the guidance, that's what I did. So that's the only difference between those two. So the 120 is for honor students and the honor program, and then for just regular, for the regular program, it is just 90 credits. So if you're in the honors program, you're doing a lot more courses but it's not 120 credits right now, it's over your four years. So you have a lot of time. But again, in your first year, it's limited to the, the amount that you get to do. Cause for your major, you'll only be able to do like one or two. Hopefully that answered your question. Oh yeah, I wanted to show you guys one last thing before because we're going back in the room soon. Um, okay, so as I said, if you go here and you go to enrolling courses and then your registration guide, this talks about all the things that you need to know about enrolling in your courses. Right, so when to enroll, what do you do before your enrollment date, on your enrollment date, what do you do after your enrollment date? Okay, so if we go all the way down to enroll, um, and I'm not the only one that uses all example psychology, they did it too on the website. This is basically what it looks like. Okay. 
Okay, this is basically what it looks like. So you're gonna see that this is what you'll see. You're enrolling in a course. For example, intro to psychology. The you have HH and then you have psych and then you have a course number and a value. So the two first letters, that's gonna be the faculty that you're in. So you guys are in the faculty of health. Then after the slash, the four other four letters that you see is the department that offers the course. So this, as you can see here, is the Department of Psychology. The other four numbers that you're gonna see is gonna be the course number. Usually how it typically goes is that the, num the ones that start with one are for your first year, the ones that starts with two, they call them like second, first level courses, third, third level courses. So the ones that start with two would be for your second year, start with three is for your third year. And, but it doesn't always go like that because I'm in my second year, but I am taking third year courses. It just depends on how many credits you have as well. And then here you see credit value. So how many credits is it worth? How many credits is the course worth? So there's a question in the chat. Um, so it says completing a bachelor's of arts in psychology honors along with an MA and a PhD. Can you become a psychiatrist? I have this question because we're on the science field in your course. Okay. This. Okay, so that is a good question, but a little bit more on the complex side. So um, this is like for a whole other, this is like an, a whole other conversation. So I won't go too much into this question only because I don't know if I am qualified to comment a lot on it, but okay, to understand what you're asking, if you do a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD if you could become a psychiatrist. So yes, that's typically the path that it takes to become a psychiatrist, doing a master's and a PhD. Um, but just the basic thing that you need to know about this at the stage that you are right now is that if you're in the honor psychology program, try, try your best when you start doing the courses and if you see that you're able to get a GPA of seven, try your best to and enroll in the specialized honor psychology program because that will give you research experience, that will give you that that allows you to go into research experience, that allows you, that's something that is very good when like you're gonna apply for grad school and stuff. But yeah, that is all I'm able to say on that topic, unfortunately. So um just like try to maintain a GPA of like seven so you can get into the specialized honors course. Okay, so before we leave, as I was saying, um, so this basically shows you the faculty, the department, the course number and the credit value. And then obviously the name of the course. So here is your catalog number, which the catalog number is what you would use to enroll in the course. You're going to go into when you, like, you guys will go over this in your, um, I'm pretty sure you'll go over this in your advising appointment, but I'm just showing you guys because it's here. And if you go to the registrar's website, you go to enroll in courses, this is something that you're going to see there. So the catalog number is what you use to enroll in the course. And yeah, you, you use that and then it's going to put the course on your timetable for you. So that is something that um, I think you guys should know. And yeah, and you plan your schedule with the visual schedule builder if you're able to use it. I don't use it because that's just a per personal preference for me. I'm not very fond of it because it is a bit complicated for me, but everyone that I know, they use it. So you guys will probably find it easier because in for the visual schedule builder, you can enroll in your courses right there and see it at the same time. That's why people find it very convenient. Yeah, so this page tells you basically everything that you need to know about building your timetable. It talks about planning your schedule, what to do before you go in your classes, adding, dropping, and transferring or exchanging courses, which this is a tool that I'm in my second year, my last semester of my second year, and I just found out about this, that when you add a course, let's say, let's say you don't entirely want to drop the course you are or you're scared that if you drop the course your spot might get taken and you might not be able to re-enroll one thing that you can do if you find another course that you like you could there's an option there that says exchange a course so you wouldn't have to drop out and then 
if you drop out, you don't have your spot again, you could just switch it out for another course. So that was probably a little bit complicated, but um, you guys should definitely take a look at this. I'm gonna copy this link and paste it in the chat. This, Cause this link definitely tells you everything that you need to know about um, enrolling in your courses. So you just go to the registrar's office, enroll in courses, and this page tells you everything. Yeah, so that's a very cool feature of that. And again, you have to check your schedule to see if you have any conflicts because it does you can have any conflicts because you don't want to miss you don't want to miss anything in a class and it's really important especially for exams because if a conflict means that you have two courses at the same time and that is definitely not something good because you don't want to miss out right either though so you have to like drop a course or something to resolve that but yeah so it says use plot your timetable to see to make sure that you don't have any conflicts and you're able to resolve them and then the the page even tells you what you need to do after you enroll in your courses. So yeah, when you enroll in your courses, by the way, you go on your student account and you get to see what it costs, um, what's your overall cost. So we should be, we, we could go back into the now. I hope you guys got a lot of information from what I said. I feel like I talked a lot. Um, thank you so much that means a lot this is my first time really going through the entirety of a webinar so thank you so much that means a lot and I'm looking forward to meeting you too you can always come to the European International Office we're very nice here and yeah so I hope you guys got a lot of information I know I said a lot I answered a lot of questions and I talked a lot but I hope you guys were at least able to get some clarification on what it is like to be in your first year enrolling in your courses, what your timetable would look like. I even went as far as showing you my timetable, um, the different things about the Faculty of Health. Hopefully the information was helpful and remember to go and um, book your appointment. I'll see you guys in the main room. Recording. So once again, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Min Eng. I'm uh, a student success and academic advisor at the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies. I am with the Department of Economics, so I will be using examples from economics, but I will be talking about very general things that will apply to everybody. Uh, just as a, a sort of a, a point to note, this is a public forum, so it's not a private one-on-one -on -one conversation please make sure that you don't share anything that's confidential, especially your student number. So um, I would rather that you keep it private and then you can talk to an advisor afterwards if there's anything very specific that you wanna know about. Um, at this point, let me just start with uh, sharing some things that um, I think would be very important for you going forward. But you know what, do me a favor if you don't mind, put in the chat what program you're in. That will help us know a little bit more about um, about you and help me know a little bit more about uh, what programs you're in and how I could help you with some of your questions. Feel free to ask. All right, please feel free to ask. Um, if I miss it in the chat, or oh, there's a q and I think there's a Q&A um, session as well. Oh, sorry, a QA and a um, button. But if I miss any of that, please feel free to unmute yourself and just ask all right, so that we can um, we can talk about uh, what it is that you know you'd like to know. Um, again, <clears throat> excuse me. If you wouldn't mind just putting in a chat, telling me what program you are in, or you could actually just unmute yourself. So why don't we do that for a second? Would you mind unmuting yourself and just telling me what programs you guys are all in? Anybody want to share that information? Yes. Hi. Hello. Hello. Emanuela, is that right? Yes. Okay. And and what program are you in? Business and society. Business and society. Wonderful. You're going to look at our world and you're going to try and help us fix it. That's great. 
um, and you have a very business lens there. Business technology management, wonderful. Thank you. Um, anybody no. else want to share some information? Like what programs are you in? You can share it in the chat. Be in law and society. That's what's great too. IT is good too. Uh, business economics. Yeah, you're going to be seeing us, um, one of us at least. That'll be myself, that'll be Maggie, that'll be Sarah. And you may have already gotten an email from one of us. Nice to meet you guys. But just keep putting in a chat where you are, uh, where you're from and what program you're in. But I'm going to start talking. All right. So you see, um, you see the advising website here. Um, and this is the econ advising website. I'm going to use it as an example, but um, there is a, a website for labs, right? So this is the general advising website for all labs students. I'm going to put that in the chat so that if you have a laptop there, it'd be great for you to just bookmark this page so you know how to read your advisors. Uh, and so... What you want to do when you get to this particular page is scroll down and then come here. You are still a new student right now, but once you're enrolled, we actually call you a current student, right? And so what you do is you come here and click on select your department and then go down. So if you're in business and society, you're in the school, or you're in the department of social science. If you're in iTech, you are... If I'm not wrong, you're going to be either in iTech or you're going to be in School of Administrative Studies, depending on which um, tech program you're in. You're also, if it's business tech, then I believe it's um, Administrative Studies. Um, if it's LASSO, Law and Society, it's School of Social Science. And let me just click on this for an example. And this is how you reach advisors, right? Advertise, ad academic advising. Um, and here in social science, you're going to look for your program, and that's whom your advisors are, right? So every program is just slightly different. You will have um, advisors who know your program really, really well. I am an, an econ person, so I know econ really, really well, but I also know other things. And I'm going to show you some of the other things that are important for you. Thank you for sharing your programs in the chat. I see them all. Um, so again, I've given you the advising website link here. Um, for those who are in econ, you may want to have this one. Um, and okay, that's for econ advising. Uh, one of the first things I want to show you is that when you when it comes to enrollment and when it comes to choosing courses and all that, there are two things which are really important for you. One of them is really um, to know what your academic calendar looks like. And this, um, I'll close this one here. This is the academic calendar. You're gonna come here and you're going to, um, just give me one second and I'll give you the, website right there okay so if you have your laptop please bookmark some of these pages that i'm giving you right now because you're going to find that they're going to be helpful for you all the way through until you graduate uh in particular you're starting with us in the winter uh, that means you're following the 23 2023 2024 calendar every year there is one don't follow the one uh, that's not when you start and you're starting with this particular calendar. So you want to click on undergraduate right here, right? Um, and it's going to come to a page that asks you about programs. That's why I asked you, do you know what programs you're in? Really important for you to remember that. And you put it in here, right? So for example, um, I saw uh, business and society. Sorry, I can business, right? Um, and you can even scroll down. So we've got business economics here. You keep going down and you've got business and society. And you see the faculty is the one that you're in. Now, while we are on this page, I just want to show you something. For those econ students who are in business economics, please remember that you're actually in the liberal arts and professional studies faculty. Don't follow anything from Glendon College. That's a very different college. The programs here are very different from the one that you're in. 
right? So just remember liberal arts and professional studies um, and you're actually in uh, business economics right here, all right? Now going back, what this is, let me just show you again what this is, is you're looking at all the requirements for your degree. Everything, everything is spelled out in the academic calendar, right? Everything you need to know is here. Don't worry. These are general education courses that you can take, you choose from. You don't take everything that you see on the screen right now. That'd be way, way, way too much, right? Uh, so these are general education courses. You keep going down and you're gonna see major courses. There you go, major credits. These are the courses that are part of your major. Every program, every website, every academic calendar is set up very similarly, right? You're gonna see all the general education, um, but you need to take what is asked of you, a total of either 90 credits or 120 credits. So if you're in the BA program, you need to complete 90 credits. If you're in the honors program, you're looking at 120 credits. And the academic calendar tells you precisely what you have to take. In some cases, like outside major, uh, these are courses that are not part of your major. They're, therefore, for instance, for econ, you cannot take anything with the word econ in it, right? Um, and a few other sort of rules, but just take a look at the academic calendar and you'll see what your 120 credits or your 90 credits are made up of. Um, the other thing I want to show you, right, is that there's something called important dates. So important dates is, um, it, it's so, how do I say this? Everything at a university is run on a deadline, right? And we talk about time management. I'm sure you've heard of the expression time management, right? It's really important for you to know all the deadlines for everything. So here you're starting in the winter, your first day of classes is Jan 8. Um, the exams uh, are here, holidays are here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, Another thing we've got here is something called add drop deadlines. You're still in the process of adding, right? Make sure that you add by, <clears throat> excuse me, this date. But even at that point, we also noticed that school started on Jan 8. You do not want to wait until the last day to add courses because you'll have missed two weeks of classes. That's not good. Um, the other thing is, uh, the classes may be full. So you really, really, really don't want to wait until that point. After that date, you need to have special permission from an instructor in order to get into any classes. Um, and they want to make sure that they're setting you up for success, not failure. So again, it goes back to how much information do you have about the class? Um, are, they, are they seeing that? Okay, it's, we've gone too far already. The student's not going to be able to catch up. And at that point, they may not give you permission. Chances are it's hard to get permission. Now, the date, the drop deadline. Now, this is not something that students want to know about when they haven't even enrolled and when you haven't even started. But I need to show this to you. The reason is sometimes things don't turn out the way you think they do. Um, I'm estimating, I'm asking you to estimate two to three hours of study time for every hour in class. If you enroll for a three credit course in one term, which is like winter is one term, a three credit course translates approximately into three hours of classroom time per week. For three hours of classroom time per week, please put aside two to three hours of study time, right? That means you're putting in an investment of 12 hours per week for one three credit course. You put on more and uh, you take say 12 credits for the term, you take 15 credits for a term, it all adds up because for 12 credits, you're putting in 36 hours of study time, which is 48 hours. A full-time job is actually 40 hours a week. So you're talking about a full-time job here with 12 credits per term. Our full course load is 15 credits per term. So folks who want to who, who are very um, who are very keen on finishing a 90 credit degree in three years, you're looking at doing about 30 credits per year, right? Um, you're starting in a winter, which means the full course load is starting with 15 credits. 
I know it's all numbers. Um, and it's all going to add up at some point, but I need to just let you know. And then if you have any questions, come back for another session or talk to an advisor, right? So anyways, it's um sometimes we take on more than we can chew and we don't even know it. Um, I know some people don't like to hear that on the first day. I do apologize if, if you're sort of, you know, um, but I want to know, I want you to know that if things don't seem like they're going too well, um, there is such a thing as a drop in the course. Dropping a course doesn't mean you get all your money back, but dropping a course means it disappears from your transcript. In other words, if you don't think you're going to pass something, and again, I do apologize for saying this on the very first orientation day, right? Um, but it's important that you know this, that you have that option to drop. Refund tables are very different. Refund tables tell us you how much money you get back by a certain time. So you start in the winter term here. If you start, uh, each class is start on the 8th. If you determine within the first week that, you know, this course isn't going to go for you, it's just not right, then if you drop it by that time, you get 100% refund credit to, to your account. You drop it past that, and the refund amount goes down somewhat. And this is why I wanted to show you the option is there to drop, but then again, it is also going to impact you financially. If you pass the deadline to drop something so that it disappears, you can still drop it, but we call it a withdrawal at this point. And you get a W on your transcript. W simply says the student didn't complete the course. She didn't drop the course, right? You don't want to show, you don't want it to show up too often on your transcript, but if you need to, you need to. That's all there is to it. Every school, every college has something about this. Every school, every college has a withdrawal or a drop policy. Um, and so if any other school wants to look at a transcript after, they understand what a withdrawal means. However, because you are international students, one thing you want to do is before you actually um, drop a course or think about dropping a course, I would like you to speak to our hosts for today, York International. So York International is about all things international, everything. Whether you wanna, whether you're here from another country, whether you wanna go to another country to study, they take care of these things, right? But they also have advisors that are gonna help you with a whole bunch of things. One of this is immigration, right? And so here you're looking at an immigration specialist um, who can answer all your questions about your study permit, how to get your study permit, what happens if you have a problem with your study permit. Please, please, please seek advising from our advisors here, the different ways of connecting them with them. The reason I bring up immigration advising is that I know that study permits mean you need to have a full-time status, which is nine credits per term, okay? Nine credits per term. Some courses are three credits, some courses are six, a spanned over a full year. But either way, you're counting nine credits per term. I just talked to you about drop and withdraw. If dropping a course means you're gonna fall below that nine credit mark, then you're no longer a full-time student. So you may wanna talk to our immigration advisors about that before you decide whether, okay, I am okay to drop my course. Okay, I'm not gonna drop my course. Either way, you become better informed. And this is what our plan is, to make you better informed so that you can make better decisions for yourself. Um, so going back here, we have undergraduate dates, which are very important. I've shown you the, uh, the refund dates, which is also very important. I also brought you to the <clears throat> International Advisor page which is also very, very important. What else I wanna show you is this, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, very often uh, you need to do things, right? We've got something called online services. My online services covers everything you ever need to know and ever need to do, which is why I'm bringing you here. Right, so please consider doing this, consider looking through this uh, when you get a chance, just to know that your resources are like right here. 
just give me a moment. I'm going to chat to see if anyone has any questions in the chat. Um, I don't see any questions at this point. So um, I think we're okay for now. Just give me a second. Yeah, I think we're okay for now. Um, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask if you have any questions. All right, so my online services. So you've got all kinds of things here. Great things, money, enrollment, everything that's here. Um, one thing I want to point out to you is this. Enrollment windows tell you when you're actually allowed to enroll. As new students, you would be allowed to enroll um, as soon as you're given a, a, a package. So you would come, you would um, go to my file, right? Look at my file, my file, which is M-Y-F-I-L-E. My file is, um, is something that's important for every new student to keep an eye on. Let me just take a look here. See, my file is right here. Let me just open it up and show you. Um, so everything you need to know about what to do next is going to be in my file. Your offer of admission, whether you're, um, whether you're accepted, not accepted, what information is still required from you, whether you have transfer credit, you don't have transfer credit, um, whether you have to book or manage an appointment, right? And so basically, if you see something there that says book slash manage, if you see and you, if you see on your offer of admission, right, you scroll down all the way through to the one page two, page three, however many pages you've got. If it says accept your offer, book, manage your appointment, please make sure you book the appointment. It helps you move forward in your enrollment process. If you don't book that appointment, you're not going to have anything open to you. You're going to be a little bit stuck right, and a little bit behind in the enrollment process. So please make sure you book the enrollment appointment, but you're gonna do it through this web page right here. Now, what I also wanted to show you is this. Um, you're going to also want to look at your fall winter grade report when you have fall or winter classes. Um, and you can look at your summer grade report if you take classes in the summer. What is a grade report? A grade report is a report card, right? So it's like high school. In high school, at the end of the year, they give you a report card. It tells you if you're doing well. It tells you when you're not doing so well. So it's really important at the end of every session. In your case, it means in May, right? Your term is going to end. That's also the session end for fall, winter. And in May, the great report will be published when all your grades are ready. Take a look at that grade report piece. It's really important that you do that. All right. Um, the other thing now to show you is that you have some choices to make. One thing about uh, programs is that you need to enroll in your courses and you need to choose your courses. The academic calendar tells you what courses you need to take. The course description, the York Courses website gives you the description of each. It also gives you uh, the schedule for each course. So here we go. Subject again, you're in a fall winter session. So please do that, right? Uh, I'm gonna give you an example in econ just because I'm in econ, so if you don't mind. Um, and then I'm gonna go click on search courses. Because we're in the liberal arts and professional studies program, please choose only AP econ courses. Uh, Glendon is GL. You're gonna see different initials, right? But for your program, we're in AP, and so that would apply to all of the programs. Just look for AP courses. Um, I see a question in the chat. Just give me a second, Joda. Just hold on a second. I'll be right with you. So if I look at this one in particular, it's going to say here um, a prerequisite. This is a description. This says fall. What you guys are looking for is make sure 
you go down and you find the winter ones, term W. First of all, you're not going to be able to enroll in anything that says fall, and you're not going to enroll in anything that says Y for year, because that started in September. So you're only looking for, all of you are only looking for courses that start with a W right there, right? And when you're looking for these courses, make sure that you actually look at the schedule. So in this particular case, oops, something says blended here. Blended means that um, it's sometimes online, it could be in person, it could be synchronous or asynchronous. Right, so you have to watch out for all that. You see all these notes on the side. Please read through every single note you see before you enroll in a course. Um, some courses are really easy. There's no note on the side whatsoever. Some courses you have notes. Please make sure you look at those notes before you enroll. You need a cat number in order to enroll. A cat number is like a barcode. Right, It barcodes the section you want, the course you want, the term you want. All that is captured in these six uh, digits right here. You only need one CAT number for each course. So in this particular example, you see tutorial and then you see CAT numbers. Blended doesn't have a CAT number. Tutorial has a CAT number. So you just pick the tutorial that meets your needs, right? Your schedule, et cetera, et cetera. You just use one cat number to choose your course. Let me use another example here. This one here, I would like to show you, doesn't have much of a note. They're all lectures. Lectures will usually show, um, let me just, Click here to see what we find. It's actually giving you um, the date, the time, and a location. This also indicates to you that this is an in-person course. So lecture is in-person, all right? Um, that's the cat number for this particular time. Not many notes, you have a course outline you can click on, but you're also looking for a term W. So any course that you're looking for, make sure you have term W and make sure you watch out for all these types of courses. But I brought you here for all these things up here. Every course that you take or most courses would have a prerequisite. Some may have co-requisites. Read these very, very carefully because they will help you determine what sequence to take your courses in. Free means before, co means at the same time or together. Prerequisites must be taken before the courses you're taking. Co-requisites, if they're not done already, can be done at the same time. Another thing you want to watch out for is this, NCR. That's a terrible, terrible, terrible thing to see. It means no credit retained. Make sure that the alert goes off when you see this. It means that in this particular case, please note that these courses may not be taken by any students who has passed. In other words, the condition is written for you. Don't take this course. You will not get any credit for it. No credit retained means even if you get an A on this, the three credits you earned are not earned at all, and the A you get is not calculated at all. In other words, no credit retained. So watch out for this very carefully. The other thing you wanna watch out for is course credit exclusions. You're gonna see this in many of your courses, right? Um, and you wanna make sure that you do not take courses that are course credit exclusions of each other. In other words, if you are looking to take one of these, you wanna take this course, you see that these ones are all course credit exclusions. You don't take any of these if you take this. If you take any of these ones, don't take this. Course credit exclusions are courses 
that have overlapping content. And if they have overlapping content, you would not be granted credit for both courses. In other words, even if you did well, you're not gonna get credit for it. One of them is gonna get lost, right? So just be really careful when you see these things. I'm gonna answer Joseph's question at this point. You ask, please, when is the latest date someone can arrive on campus after classes has started? Uh, maybe if a person's uh, visa is delayed. Um, you can arrive on campus at pretty much when you arrive on campus. However, if you are in residence, if you are in dormitories, please make sure you let your residence head know. In other words, connect with housing to let them know that you're coming in late. If you're coming in late and you're gonna be late for classes, you wanna make sure that you do a lot of catching up when you get here because um, things go pretty fast. Not only that, I'm a bit worried about transition. Many of you uh, are, are new to York University, whether you're coming from another part of Ontario, another part of um, Toronto, coming from another college or university, coming from another town, another province, coming from another country, another time zone, another weather zone. This transition, right? It means there's a lot of getting used to. And getting used to takes up time. Getting used to takes up energy. Getting used to means you may need to sleep in a little bit, just a little bit, to get over jet lag or to get over just changes in your schedule, right? So if you're coming in really, really late, you may want to defer your um, admission. You may want to defer your offer of admission in terms of how late. Um, you saw earlier on that I showed you when the last day to enroll was. You saw where the refund dates are. Whether or not you're able to attend a class, those refund dates are going to kick in, right? In other words, um, hold on a moment, fall, winter refund dates, right? So catching up with work is one thing. Um, if you don't come in the end, you're going to be, you're going to be responsible for paying the fees anyway, unless you drop the courses by a particular time. So please make sure that you make those decisions uh, before the deadlines are up. Does that make sense? I hope that helps you. Um, if your visa is delayed, let's see how late it's delayed. You, you may wanna make some decisions at this point, uh, find out how long that's for. And if you need to, you need to ask for a deferral of admission. Let me just show you something, hold on a moment. Uh, one of the great things here, is that um, we've got a search bar right here. And I love doing this. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna click on this and go uh, deferral of offer. Deferral of admissions, here we go. If you are unable to, to make it, right? It might be a good idea to defer your admission and this application, the deadlines, all that right there. Please read through it. I'm putting the link in the chat for you. Okay, so um, let me take a look at the next question. I hope that helps you. Um, the next question comes from Maria. Thank you, Maria. Do winter intake some uh, students have summer break? Yes. Summer break is for everybody, right? Um, classes in the summer are optional. They are not necessary for the programs that you're in. Now, if you're in a very specialized program, you may wanna check in with your advisors. But from what I understand, liberal arts programs um, are allowed to take the summer off. Um, I know for sure the courses that we looked at, the programs we looked at, um, Bachelor of Commerce, um, Economics, Business and Society, Law and Society, ITech, those programs do not require you to take courses in the summer. Um, so it really is off for you, unless you wish to, that's all there is. Okay, um, all right. 
So let me return to what I was saying. I hope that has helped you. Um, okay. Let me see where we're at. We looked at course descriptions, right? That was the last thing we looked at. And I wanted to make sure that you understood uh, the, the, the course credit exclusions. So we've talked about important dates. We've talked about add deadlines, drop deadlines, refund deadlines. We've talked about course descriptions, prerequisites, co-requisites, course credit exclusions. We've talked about the academic calendar, which defines what it is that you need to do, right? Um, sometimes you could look for a checklist. So for us, again, if you take a look at this page, there are checklists and, and for econ, we've got checklists here. You would again, much like the academic calendar, you'll be following the fall winter 2023. Just as an example, a checklist basically reflects everything that's in the academic calendar. So it gives you information, it tells you the courses you need to do, it gives you the different sections. Now checklists may look different. Don't worry about how different they look. Just make sure that you have the right one and you have the one for the right year, right? Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, going into advising services here, um, you can look for, let me just see. Talk to your, um, talk to your advisors. Make sure that you have the proper information that you need, right? Um, and there's more information here for your labs, for your labs advising as well. Um, just give me one moment. I'm sorry. Just give me one second, please. All right. Now, we talked about, let me just go to degree planning here. And degree planning here also gives you more information. Online services, like we talked about, course outlines, and like I said, degree checklists. And degree checklists may look a little bit different, but that's okay, like I said, right? Um, you want to make sure that you follow these ones, 2023, 2024. You click on that. And I'm going to give this to you in the chat. That's for all LAPS students. Um, and just to give you an example, you've got Business and Society. You've got two programs there. And I'm just going to show you one, just for example. And you see that the layout is a little bit different, right? So the layout's a little bit different, um, but, <clears throat> but the checklists are there for your um, reference. So please, you can take a look at the checklist that you want. For econ, we're asking you, please use checklists from here, simply because we've designed it for you, uh, for, for your convenience, right? And advisors will be using this one here. Coming to a new school, starting a new program, it could be a little intimidating. We want to make sure that you know that you're not alone when you go through this, right? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. There are PASS programs, right? The PASS program helps you study. There's a Snack Numeracy Assistance Center, and there's a Writing Center. Registral services are there as well. But um, for academic purposes, PASS programs are based on courses. So depending on what course you're taking, there may be a pass program, a pass session for you. I'm putting in a chat for your reference. What this is, is basically, um, and I'm gonna take a look at this one, for instance. These are folks, these peer leaders, right? The past leaders are folks who have taken these courses before and they've done really well. They wouldn't be allowed to do this if they had not done really well. And, and you would sign up as per session, section, I'm sorry. This day and time, you're going to be with Jamie Lynn Butler, who's going to help you study for this course, right? Um, and so past sessions <clears throat> are study sessions that are led by peer leaders. Take a look through this. 
there will be a new schedule put up for the winter. This is a math center. Um, much as the other, as much as PASS was designed for particular courses and particular sections, PASS is for anybody who has a question about math, any kind of math. And these are your tutors. You don't pay extra for this. And this is their schedule here. Again, when you come, before you come, there's gonna be a winter schedule. And there may be in-person sessions, there may be online sessions. If you have a math question of any kind, don't hesitate to ask one of these people here. There's also a writing center. I've met the people who run the center. They're lovely people. It's not a remedial writing center. In other words, it's not trying to, to save you from failing. But if that's your case, they will help you as well. They're here to help everybody become better writers. They really want to do that. And whether you're an A or an A plus or a B or a C student, right, in your writing, bring a draft to these guys. They'll take a look at your draft and they'll give you feedback. They're not here to correct your spelling. It's, it's not like that. Or tell you, oh, you know what? Uh, you need a period here or your grammar is not so great. Now, if they find that your spelling's not great or your grammar's not great, they might just tell you, you may want to fix your grammar. But other than that, it's a matter of their reading through it, telling you, you know, the flow is really great, but to make it better, how about you switch your paragraphs around or something? And that's fantastic feedback for writing. So please don't hesitate to reach out to any of these resources that you see here. There's another resource that I'd like to actually talk about. Counseling services. Now, counseling services isn't something that um, many people want to talk about. And truth be known, I come from a culture where counseling isn't something we ever mention, simply because culturally, traditionally, counseling isn't so hot. It's not so popular, right? And sometimes there might be a stigma attached to it. What I'm saying is um, counseling is available. If you feel completely stressed out, if you feel you need to talk to somebody um, about something, right? That's not academic. It's personal. Um, maybe you feel down. Maybe you feel really stressed out over something. Maybe you're feeling very anxious. Counseling is allowed. Counseling is part of your fees. Counseling is a service that is offered to students, whoever might need counseling. And I'm here to tell you, please don't let any stigmas or taboos stop you if you feel that this is a service that you need for yourself. Um, that's not how it's viewed uh, in Toronto or in at York, right? So please make sure that you take a look at all this, all these services, make sure that you're familiar with them um, because if you need something, they're here for you. There's another thing that I wanted to um, I wanted to point out. Studying and learning is different uh, from between people from one person to another. Learning skills services uh, has workshops for everybody. It's not one size fits all. It really isn't. And this is what this is about. They've got all kinds of guides, all kinds of workshops all online. They've got in-person, they've got advisors. If one doesn't work for you, try something else, right? I'm not saying skip an exam to go for any of these workshops, but when you're you know, resting, anything like that, check out some of these workshops, even the virtual ones, especially the virtual ones especially if it's on a weekend, you're not doing anything, see if you can actually take a look at what's offered here, all right? Because again, sometimes it feels a bit alone. And knowing that you've got resources is going to help you a lot, all right? Um, what else can I show you? Student financial services. 
this is a good place to be as well. This one, um, this one talks about payments. It talks about um, different deadlines, things that you need to know. Your student account is going to reflect everything about your payments, right? So come here, take a look at this. Um, and it tells you how and when to pay, how to understand your statement, what happens if you owe money, all these things. What you also want to consider doing is uh, filling out a student financial profile. So a student financial profile, first of all, let me give you this website. Now a student financial profile is a one, is a multi-purpose online application form that is used to apply for everything, everything, right? And you can apply for work, you can apply for money, all kinds of things. Please consider submitting it. There are deadlines, there are timings. Um, please, again, watch out for the deadlines, but please, uh, consider, there we go, sorry, just to show you what it all looks like. Um, please consider submitting a student financial profile simply because it's used to apply for everything. Okay, so I've talked about advising. I've talked about important dates. I've talked about course descriptions, academic resources like PASS, SNAP, Writing Center. I've shown you the online services grade reports, um, we've talked about counseling as well, we've talked about enrollment. Um, one last thing I could show you, right, is the, um, sorry, I'm just gonna go back here and I'm gonna go, registration and enrollment services. Oops, sorry. This one right here. This is fantastic. This tells you everything you need to know. Another page that you really want to bookmark. Again, find out when you can enroll, like we talked about already, fall, winter enrollment, and how to enroll. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All the steps you need to have, everything you need to know about enrollment. Okay, um, I've talked a lot. I've given you a lot of information, right? Um, oh, but there's one more thing. I'm so sorry. After you've enrolled, back to this particular website here. And if it does that, you just click to start a new website. Come all the way down to this that says plot my timetable. I cannot go in there because I'm not a student. But when you've enrolled in your courses, you want to come here and plot your timetable. That's going to be the timetable you follow, right, for the term, because that's going to show what you have officially and formally enrolled in. These are courses that are going to go on your transcript. These are courses that are on your account statement. That means you have to pay for them. So that's what's going to show you what you've officially enrolled in and you're responsible for please plot your timetable after you've enrolled in your courses. All right, so it's 9.59. I've talked for a whole long time now. Does anybody want to unmute and ask me questions? Anybody at all? Hello. Hi. I see your question, uh Fran. Do you have some... Um, should I just read the question or do you have one that is a bit different? Yes, it's about uh, like transfer credits. Okay. I want to know that, yeah, like um, I already have like 24 transfer credits now, but All right. how can I know what which of them that already on the um, courses that I can choose? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. your transfer credit statement 
shows you how many transfer credits you have. Like you said, 24 credits. Now, 24 credits will probably also say that you are waived for um, general education, social science, right? That should show on your statement of transfer credit, I believe. Does that show that? So take a look. Um, it only show. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, wait. Wait a minute. No, that's okay. So it usually shows for 24 credits, you usually get social science, the social science category, one six credit social science course waived from your general education requirements. That means you have 18 credits left uh, to apply to other things. Those 18 credits usually apply to your outside major requirements. For liberal arts and professional studies, usually for the outside major requirements. Now, if you have something called course credit exclusions that are granted through your transfer credit, it means that some of the courses you've taken in the past um, are similar to the courses that you may have to take at York University. If that's the case, then I would say, please don't take these courses because you may lose your transfer credit if you take the courses again, right? But these are courses that you do not need to take. So if you're given course credit exclusions in particular, please don't take those courses. That's number one. That's from your transfer credit statement. The second thing you wanna know is that an advisor will help you through your course selection when you've got transfer credits. If you uh, are able to book an appointment through my file, please make sure you book that appointment. And on that date, you're gonna be given information on what courses to enroll in. Uh, so first step always, is to accept your offer. Second step is to book that enrollment appointment, right? And then the third step is to wait until that enrollment appointment and an advisor will reach out to you either by email um, or there may be another way to connect, but very often by email and they will let you know what courses you need to take. Does that help? Okay, I get it. Yes, a lot. Thank you so much. No problem at all. No problem. Anybody else? I'm checking the chat. There's nothing in the chat at this point. Um, is uh, there... can I ask one more? Um, sure. There's no one else asking right now, so, so we're good. Um, so um, am I like in Rome? Uh, enroll any courses right now or wait until the advisor contact me first? My suggestion is you uh, you um you wait until that enrollment uh, appointment takes place, right? Um, very often you would not be allowed to enroll until that appointment takes place. So first step again, go to my file. If there is anything that it allows you to book an enrollment appointment, you do that right away, please. Um, and at that point, you know that by that date, you're gonna get that information. Uh, for, for an econ student, you definitely, if you have transfer credit, you definitely cannot enroll until uh, that appointment takes place. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Is everybody else okay? Does anybody else have any questions, concerns, doubts, worries? You guys are fantastic. Nothing? Are you excited to come? I hope you're excited. Sure, to yeah. Good. Thanks, Trent. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, anything at all? Don't tell me I've answered everything. Oh, okay. I'm just going to keep talking. All right. Um, I see a question here about uh, move-in dates, right? So move-in dates, um, please check out housing. So do you know how to reach housing? Do you have an email where you can reach housing? Um, 
if the deadline is the deadline, sorry, um, you had said the deadline, Saidiman. Um, is the deadline for you the latest day to to move in, or is that the first day to move in? Either way, any questions you have. Okay, so you don't not the first day. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to reach out to housing. I think you probably have heard from them already. In other words, uh, you have had an email correspondence with them. Please do that. Uh, if you don't yet know how to reach housing, let's just go to housing now and see how you can reach them. Okay, I'm gonna give you this link here. Um, and they have a contact here um, and you've got, well, that's summer. So we're not gonna worry about that. And you have to meet with us virtually, which is also really good. Kiel Campus move in. They're probably still looking at fall dates here, right? So I'm gonna just take a quick look to see what it says here. Welcome to York University, commonly asked questions, move in day. Move-in day for fall is this, returning students, early arrival requests. Here you go, Sadiwan, early arrival requests, right? Um, what they probably mean is that we expect you to only move in on that date. That organizes things. That way, um, everybody knows when people are coming in, when to get the rooms ready for you, um, when you get to meet your housemates, your roommates, things like that. But if you want to arrive early, I would say, please um, take a look at this and you want to submit this. In your case, it's obviously not August 8th, right? Um, it's a different deadline because all these here are still for the fall intake. Take a look at the FAQ, see if that helps, right? And um, if you want to, you can also, you've got orientation. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can get anything more um, precise for you. So there are a lot of things for you to do to get in, uh, to, to get ready, right? But there is contact information here. And in the previous page, we saw also different ways of meeting with housing to ask questions. Uh, does this help, Sadiman? Okay, so you're talking about this particular video that we're recording. It's going to be on the York International website. They have a whole series of pre-arrival seminars on different topics. Today's was on um, enrollment. Do you have any more, any questions? Please don't be shy. You know what? I'm an advisor and, and I really want to to encourage you. Uh, if you have any questions about your academic progress, um, if you don't know who to talk to even, please go and talk to your academic advisor. In my time, we didn't really have academic advisors and it was, it was tough, right? But there are academic advisors now uh, and, and they, they're here to answer questions, really. While our main goal is your academic advising, we also watch out for your success. So anything, if you do badly, if you do well, check in. It's really important that you check in once a session, at least. A session is fall, winter. Summer is also called a session. We call it fall term, winter term. In the summer, it's broken up into two terms, S1 and S2. If you want to plan for your summer, the summer schedule is available in February. So that's the earliest we'll know what's being offered in the summer. If you want to plan to go away, you don't have to wait for the February for the February schedules. Um, you can plan your vacations. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to tell you, um, advisors are friendly people, right? Um, and, and please don't hesitate to come and, and talk to one of them. I'm, I'm taking a look at, uh, at a chat here. 
Hi, Mohsen. Okay, so currently checking my file. All right. Um, but I don't have any appointment time, just a message that says learn when your online course enrollment starts, as you mentioned, so I can enroll right now. As for the next steps, as someone is looking to get a place for myself, um, okay, uh, you are wondering when you can enter Canada. So one question first, you can't enroll for now, right? Um, if the message says learn when your enrollment course enrollment begins, yeah, you're not actually allowed to enroll until that that happens. Um, if you do have a question about this, all right, if you have a question because you're a lapse, hold on a moment. Lapseadv at yorku.ca. So, Mosin, if you don't know um, what in terms of, of when your enrollment window is, please email lapsadv at yorku.ca, all right? For laps econ, uh, for laps for economics, right? You can email your questions to yorku, uh, sorry, I can't type again, to lapsecon at yorku.ca. Um, Hold on a second. There. Um, or uh, just book my file. Come to the advising website, which is this one right here. Um, I'm going to put it in the chat again, right? Um, and you can come and see one of us right here. That's how you reach us. Uh, this is a drop-in system. If you see Qless, Qless is a drop-in system. It's a it's an online queuing system. Uh, you put your name on the queue. We summon you. We call you, and then we'll telephone you. We'll we'll do a Zoom meeting with you. If you're on campus, we'll summon you, and you come and see us, right? And this is how you actually see, uh, seek advising from an advisor. So let me go backwards here. The second question, Mosin, um, I think you need to talk to, <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me for a second. Please speak with an immigration advisor about when you can enter Canada. Um, that's something that you would need to be advised on with regard to an entry visa, with regard to your study permit, all that sort of thing. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know if you picked up the website. You could actually just, um, you could search for York International Immigration. All right. So York International Immigration, if you can't find the website, um, I'll show you how this is done. Just right here. Uh, York Chanel, right? And you can just do that. Um, and I'll click right there. And that brings you to the main website. At the main website, you look through all these tabs and you'll find one that says immigration, immigration overview, and that's where you go. And then you get to the specialist right there. You're welcome. You're welcome. Very welcome. Um, does anyone else has quest have questions? There are places to study on campus. There are quiet places. There are not so quiet places. Um, there's a subway station that will take you downtown. Is it mandatory to book an enrollment appointment? If you're my file on my file if you see book slash manage enrollment appointment please click on that if it gives you dates and that you have to um book please book also take a look at your offer of admission Here's your offer of admission that's also on my file it's sometimes called a decision letter or an admission letter an offer letter 
different names for it. Take a look at that. It'll tell you the first thing you need to do is accept it. Please accept the offer. Uh, and the second thing it's likely to say is to book an enrollment appointment. So from my understanding, everybody needs an enrollment appointment, um, whether it's uh, to, to open up a window or it's um, to have your transfer credit assessed. Um, so um, Gakran, I'm not sure your exact situation. We, we don't need to ask that right now. But if you do have any transfer credit of any kind, please book an enrollment appointment. Um, if not, then you can email um, the you can email the office of admission and ask them, do I need an enrollment appointment? But like I said to um, to Sideman earlier on, right? Um, you're likely going to book one and you can't see how to enroll or when you are allowed to enroll until you book one. I hope that helps. Anybody else? You're welcome. So I'm just gonna just chat because in terms of enrollment, um, okay, so one more thing about enrollment is that sometimes uh, certain sections are hard to get into. And when you're actually enrolling for courses, you're gonna find that um, it says reserved or it might actually say, so you're gonna en go in there right, access the enrollment module. Um, and sometimes it tells you that, that a course is full or it tells you that it's reserved for some reason and you can't, um, you can't get into that course. Don't worry about it. At this particular point, if it's a section that you really, really must get into, uh, well, first choice is, Try and find another section. Second choice, you can keep trying, but don't click incessantly, right? With a cat number. Click, wait a minute or two, click again, wait a minute or two, click again. There are a lot of changes happening right now. It's an online enrollment system. As students make changes, and if they decide to drop a course or drop a section, if you happen to be right there, you're the one getting it. So that's one thing you can do. Right, so the first thing is see if you can find another section, find another course. Second thing is uh, keep trying. Third thing, if there's something called reserved, right? If it's reserved, the registration and enrollment module, which you see right here, like they're gonna tell you that a course is restricted, enrollment is restricted or reserved. What you could do if you wish is um, go to the website, um, hold on a second. Go to the website that they tell you to. They're going to tell you to go to this. Oh, sorry. They're going to tell you to go to this website. You come here if it's reserved, right? And what you do is you look for the different uh, departments and you can write to the department and say, um, I would like to try and get into this course. Is there any availability? Could I get permission please to get into this section? They'll tell you if you can or they'll tell you if you cannot, right? So this is the course contact directory in case you encounter any uh, any restrictions and such. Um, I'm sorry, there was one more thing that's really important for me to tell you about. This is called the GPA calculator, right? The GPA calculator. Now, we know that GPA stands for grade point average, 
but you may not know that York University's grade point average scale is different from a lot of schools. They have a nine point grade point average, right? So our highest grade point average is a nine. Many universities have a four. If you go below a four at York University, you're gonna be on academic warning. For a BA, a 90 credit BA, right? You usually need a C average to be in good standing. In certain programs like Bachelor of Commerce, for instance, if you have a C, you're gonna get kicked out of the program, you need a 5.0, right? Which is a C plus. What this means to me, right? is although E's and F's are failing grades, so you actually pass a course with a D, you're not gonna be in good academic standing until you have a C plus average, right? So um, again, some of the things I'm saying to you first time, we haven't even met yet, but um, please try to avoid these grades right here. And if you're in a particular program, please aim for the C plus and avoid the Cs as well. Simply because averaging rules, if you have the average that you need, all you need to do going forward is to maintain that average. If you fall below the average and you wanna later on bring it up again, you're gonna have to get A's and B's just to bring up those averages. It's a lot easier for you to start off with a C plus average. I don't mean to put so much pressure on you, but it's good that you know what the guidelines are and what your boundaries are. So please, um, if possible, try and get the C plus average to be in good standing in your program. If you fall below that, if you fall below a C and you're worried, there are office hours for professors as well. Talk to your props. Find out how you can do better. Um, if you have your TAs as well, go for pass. Go for ask questions. Just go for workshops, learning skills, services. Talk to your advisor, all that. Is that okay? It's 10.22. We've got maybe three minutes or so left. If anyone has any questions, um, we can continue. Other than that, um, I'm happy to let you go so that we can move back into the main room. I thank you so much for your attention. You guys are fantastic. Are you, are you really there? I hope you're really there. Um, but um, I wish you all the best. I wish you all the best as you start your new program, um, as you come here to Toronto. Uh, as you come to York University, it's it's a very inclusive space. We're nice people, um, and we're waiting to welcome you. All right, and as I said earlier, you're not here alone. There are lots of there are lots of people around who can offer support. It's a different place, but you're not alone. So, if no one else has any more questions for me, I'm gonna let you guys go. I'm gonna stop recording this. And um, and I'm going to wish you all the best and can't wait to welcome you to York University. Take good care. Your questions. Please keep your questions in mind. Uh, we'll have plenty of time to ask questions uh, towards the end. The presentation run, run time, time should be about 15 to 20 minutes. So if we have until 1025 afterwards, then, then there will be plenty of time for questions. Um, so let's get started. Welcome, everybody, uh, to the International Student Enrollment Webinar. My name is Itai Vitsul. Uh, I'm an academic advisor with the Lassonde School of Engineering. We're joined today also by the manager of academic advisor, uh, academic advising, Althias Michael Brown. Um, we'll be here to go over what some, some of the materials uh, that you need to know um and answer a few questions so let's get started uh on the agenda today we'll be talking about how to book your enrollment access uh in very general terms if i could see some thumbs up if you already booked your enrollment session might have also been called an academic enroll an enrollment appointment oh amazing rudra 
fantastic. And that's it. Okay, good. So, so we'll go over that. Um, there was also uh, a, an appointment last Friday on October the 13th. Anybody already had their enrollment session? Again, with a thumbs up reaction. All right, so you're you're all set, Rudra. Fantastic. Uh, and Arian, great. Did wow. Okay, so we'll breeze through this part then. Um, those of you who have not yet had your enrollment session will be able to address some questions and concern. Uh, we'll talk about what to expect on your enrollment date. We'll talk a little bit about financial matters, go over a few important dates to keep in mind, uh, and we'll touch on other topics along the way, things like transfer credits and transfer credit statements, um, enrollment confirmation letters that you might need to get with a, a few useful contacts for you to get help if you need some assistance in your enrollment. So let's get started. Booking your enrollment access date. So this is something that that uh, you might have also seen called an enrollment appointment. You go onto yorku.ca slash myfile and log in with your student number or your York reference number that becomes your student number and your date of birth. From there, you'll, cl you'll click book slash manage my enrollment appointment and follow the steps. There might be a few clicks before you see the next available appointment, which is November 10th. Uh, it's gonna be a Friday as well. You reserve the earliest available date, but if that one is totally full, there will be another one in December. So don't worry, just click on the December one, and book it then. There should still be ample space available in your classes. What to expect? First and foremost, don't be alarmed by what the, the reservation booking says. This is not an in-person appointment. We have the option for those students who are near campus to come by and uh, get some help in one of our local computer labs in the Williams Small Center. But this is not required to be on campus. You can get everything. You will be getting everything you need to know by email at around 10 a.m. of your enrollment date. You, from there, you'll be able to proceed independently in following the instructions on how to register in courses and enrolling in your required classes as provided by the checklist. Your access will open on the date of enrollment, but you don't have to register in courses right away. Your access remains open until January, and we'll look at that date uh, when we get towards the dates, but uh, the, your appointment only indicates when you can start accessing your course enrollment. Uh, obviously, we recommend that you enroll as soon as possible once your enrollment opens, because that just guarantees that you're able to get into the courses and the sections that you might uh, prioritize before they all fill up. Now, how to enroll. Uh, take a note of this website, that's registrar.yourq.ca. That's the registrar's office website. It's the main hub to everything that you need to know and to do where it comes to enrollment and documents. Um, under the heading on that website titled Courses and Enrollment, you'll be able to search course timetables uh, to access the enrollment, the York University courses website and catalog, and uh, the add slash drop courses link. This is where you can find uh, the registration and enrollment module where you actually sign there yourself up for courses. Here's also where you can plot your timetable and see officially which courses you're registered in, how they fall into a timetable. Generally, this will work, but because winter late courses, uh, we'll go over what exactly that means. Uh, most Lausanne students will be enrolled in courses from term W. Oh, the, the timetable system might not work perfectly. We'll go over and show you um, an alternate way to plot your timetable automatically so you don't have to grapple with a pen and paper. But I found that pen and paper sometime is the way to go. Um, this is, under here, you'll also be able to find your course grades, your, your course list and grades when that becomes relevant uh, and your exam schedule as well as your course websites through eClass. Next, so we clicked on search course timetables. We found the York University courses website. Uh, to begin your course search, you'll click on search by subject, then find your desired course and section with 
uh, a note of the catalog number. You'll note the catalog number aside and then plug it into the registration and enrollment module uh, that we talked about a second ago. After you click search by subject, you select your session. Basically what the session is, is, is a, a division of time within the calendar year. We have two sessions, one which encompasses both fall and winter that runs from September to April. You're joining that halfway through just for the winter term. The second session takes place in the summer. It begins in May and ends in August. So right now, only one session is available. It makes our lives easier. As an example, I selected EECS. Uh, that is the course code, the subject code for the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Most of you will likely take a course or two in this subject. After we click search, you see a full catalog of the courses that are offered um, in that subject. So as an example, EECS 1012, uh, you click on fall, winter, 2023-2024 course schedule, and you see when and how the course is offered in all the different sections. So, and that's the following page. Basically, what you want to do is scroll all the way down. The first sections of each course will likely be only in the fall. You missed the fall. <laughs> You're admitted in winter, so you'll have to take note of the term in which the course is offered. It has to say term W if you're in digital media or term WL if you're uh, any, any other major, which stands for winter late. Each entry for each section of a course will show you the time and day for the lecture. So for example, lecture for uh, section M takes place on day R, that's Thursday at 8.30 in the morning. It lasts 120 minutes, so that's two hours. The, the course, is, the lecture is from 8.30 to 10.30. And the location is very hall, lecture hall B. You look at the two lab times in the same way. You'll notice that it's in the Williams Small Center. If you are, uh, you'll become familiar with it. That's also where you go and get your York University student card. Um, and once you've selected the lab that suits your timetable and your needs compared to your other courses, you select the catalog number associated with it. And here we have one highlighted. Uh, plug that catalog number into the registration and enrollment module, and the system will enroll you in both the lab that you selected specifically and the lecture that it's associated with. Okay, there's no separate catalog number for the lecture the single catalog number will enroll you both in the lab and the lecture that's associated with it. So in this case, the student will be in an, a one hour lecture on Mondays and Wednesdays from 11.30 to 12.30. They're in the Lausanne building lecture room B and their tutorial will be uh, an hour or so after the lecture is completed on Mondays between 1.30 p.m. and uh, lasting for three hours, so until 4.30 in the afternoon in uh, the Williams Small Center computer lab as well. Let that settle for a bit. Think of any questions, jot them down. I'll be happy to address them towards the end of the presentation. All right. Our next topic that we're going to tackle is transfer credits. All right, so transfer credits. Some of you have attended a post-secondary institution already. Some of you have uh, advanced A-levels or O-levels or IB uh, certificates that you completed in uh, secondary school. You may might be entitled to transfer credits. So how does that work? If you're entitled to transfer credits, the university should provide you with a transfer credit statement. This will have been sent by email from the Office of Admissions. If you didn't receive one, uh, an email, then you can still go to the same Registrar's Office website, click on Academic Program, and then you'll find your transfer credit statement through there. Um, if you believe you're entitled to transfer credits that haven't been assessed, or there have been some changes, like say you completed some courses in the fall, 
um, but didn't they didn't have a final grade when the original transfer credit statement went out. Um, Fujian, good question, duly noted. I'll, I'll address that in a minute. So uh, you'll request your, if you, if you need an assessment of your transfer credits, you can request a, a reassessment uh, through the same website. You go to your registrar.yorku.ca, click academic program, transfer credit statement. And from there, you'll see a form for, to, to request the transfer credit statement. Complete the form. You might need to provide some documents like course outlines, syllabi, descriptions, textbooks that were used. Uh, those could be emailed to this address, tcadm at yourq.ca. If you have a new statement, please let us know. Uh, we'll update your enrollment recommendation, um, but make sure that, that the transfer credit statement is up to date through the registrar's office and office of admissions. Uh, the transfer credit team will help you out with that. If you need assistance in enrollment, we have a specialized web page that already responds to most of the questions you might have. It's the Enrollment and Advising Q&A. Um, this link is live. When the presentation is over, it will go up on York International's website. You'll be able to click all the links here. Um, this is, in a nutshell, what's on there. Uh, when can I enroll in the in courses for next term. I'm trying to enroll, but the registration and enrollment module says I am blocked due to an advising requirement. Don't worry about that. That's for, for continuing students, not so much new students. But here, I'm trying to enroll in an EECS course, but all the seats are full or reserved. What should I do? Good question. I'm trying to enroll in a math course, but seats are, are full or reserved. What should I do? Excellent question. What happens if you're an engineering student and you want to enroll in Eng 1101, 11 or 2? Or if you're an engineering student and you want any of these physics, uh, earth and space science, and chemistry courses. Okay, Ex all excellent questions. They have their answers on the website. Again, towards the end, if, you if you've encountered these problems, we'll be able to go over that together um, as the need might arise. Okay, Fujian, uh, I'll address this right now because it seems really important. Uh, no, you, you should definitely start enrolling in courses. And the reason is that you need a certain, uh, York International will go over this in, in far more and better detail than I could over here, uh, but you need to reserve your space in classes. If you wait until your study permit is approved, then there might be, um, there might be some issues getting in spaces in, in a course that, that you need to take. Uh, take the course and you can always drop it, okay? Um, sometimes before you arrive in the country, you need to provide some sort of proof that you are in fact registered in courses meeting with the requirements of your study permit. So uh, the conditions of the study permit can't be known until you have the study permit. So, so uh, there's a little bit of a trick there, but uh, enrollment for sure is, is one of the first steps uh, to take. So book your enrollment appointment. Hopefully your study permit will be approved before then. Um, if not, you can always reach out to York International. They have the best team to help you out with any of the immigration matters. Um, they'll, they'll, you'll be in, in very good hands. Yes, so can we enroll without financial impact? We'll go over that just now, okay? Um, basically, there could be a financial impact, but in a nutshell, if you drop a course before it starts, you get a full refund. You're charged once you enroll, but you get a full refund if you drop before the course starts and maybe a few days afterwards. Uh, but before the course st starts is basically a, a really easy to remember guideline. Uh, you have a few days after that, but we'll, we'll go over that specifically. Okay, so um, registration deposit. This is the first fee that you'll need to pay to the university after your application. Um, it is deducted from your total sum of tuition owed. And the deadline for the registration deposit is uh, dependent on when you sign up for your first course. So if you had the first enrollment access 
uh, on October the 13th, last Friday, then you are able to pay your registration deposit before the deadline on November 15th. Um, if your registration date is in November, then the deadline to pay the deposit is December 10th. Uh, those of you who haven't booked yet or will book an appointment in December, that uh, registration deposit is due 10 days after you enroll in your first course. So uh, you won't wait until January, you just pay as soon as you can. What the registration deposit does is basically a guarantee for the university that you want to come here. You're registered in your courses, you paid your deposit, you're committed to actually attend courses. It, what it allows you then is to maintain your space in the classes that you're registered in. If the university doesn't have this assurance that a student wants to go here and to attend courses at York University, at a certain point, uh, they might de-enroll students who haven't paid the registration deposit. So it's really important to do this, uh, to both to reserve your, your space and class and for us to know that you're actually coming here. Um, if you paid your registration deposit, if you paid your tuition in full already, then the registration deposit is, is part of that. So don't worry about it. Instead of $300 registration deposit, you paid the full 5,000 or however much tuition is nowadays. Okay, same thing, don't sweat it. It's just a little exchange of money and recognition that hey, tuition is pretty taxing for some people um, and could take a little while to get the funds assembled. Um, how to pay all of this? If you have a Canadian bank account, uh, you'll need to add York University as a payee with your bank, uh, either through phone, telephone banking or online banking. Uh, your account number is your York University student number or your reference number as an applicant. You make the payments online by uh, either online uh, through your banking app or website or by phone all through your bank. York University does not accept uh, credit card payments for tuition. Um, you can also, and you basically pay it like any other bill that you would pay uh, uh, here in Canada. If you don't have a Canadian bank account yet, we do work in partnership with CIBC International Student Pay and Convera. I'm not sure exactly how that works, unfortunately, but those links are live uh, that you see here in the presentation. You'll be able to access them um, once the presentation is uploaded. You can also take a picture right now of the URL at the bottom of the page to uh, find the, the live links here. I'll give you a moment to do so. Okay, uh, your tuition fees, how much are you actually going to be expected to pay? Tuition is charged based on the number of credits taken, okay? The number of credits taken. The Each course is going to be either three or four or six credits uh, for the winter term, not likely to find other course credit weights. Um, and, and the fees vary by program. Okay. You can click on that live link. You'll get to here where you could actually search how much you can expect to be paying in tuition. Uh, so find the, the course and program fees for fall winter 23, 24, uh, scroll down to Lassonde and then find your program there. And it will show you, uh, your specific program tuition fees for domestic and international students. Once you registered in courses, the fees will be reflected on your student account. If you, you'll pay them off the same way that we just went over, the registration deposit, either through your Canadian bank account or through the uh, international payment systems that uh, work uh, that, that York University accepts. Um, if you have any issues to do with finances at all, uh, you need to contact financial services through the registrar's office. Uh, academic advising, unfortunately, we're, we're not so well versed in student finances to give you good information. So uh, every office and campus has its responsibility, financial services for any financial related questions. Moving on. Um, 
for some due dates when to pay your tuition, winter course tuition, the balance of what remains after your registration deposit, that is due on January 10th, okay? Winter late, you could expect it around the same time, um, even though courses will start a little bit later and, and we'll go over that. So winter term tuition, the balance of it will, do January, will be due January 10th. Some important dates, I'm not gonna go over these into in a lot of details, You'll find the link to the website where that's found on the bottom of the page. We'll go over some cliff notes here and feel free to take pictures or screenshots of the important dates uh, to keep them for your records and reference. Okay, uh, term dates. So there are two terms taking place in the winter. Some of them will be, some of you will be enrolled in term W courses. Some of you will be enrolled in uh, term WL courses. W, WL is called winter late for a reason because while classes for winter term starts on, start on January 8th, for WL it's January 22nd. So your classes will begin a little bit later. Uh, but they will largely follow the same sort of paradigm. The last day to submit winter late term work will be probably uh, the same date as, as the, the end of classes. Um, you'll have a winter reading week in term W from February 17th to 23rd. So that's a week that's been granted for students to take a little bit of a break, catch up on some work, study for their midterm exams. Um, take a mental health break if you need to as well. There is one winter study day between the end of classes and the beginning of the winter term exams, which will take place from April 10th to 26th. Okay, there are some notes here about uh, important dates and holidays that will take place during the winter term that could impact your courses uh, due to university closures. So for example, Good Friday uh, on March 29th, the university will be closed on that day. And instead, any Friday classes will be made up on, on Monday, April the 8th. Okay. Add drop deadlines. This one is important, okay? Um, you'll be looking at different dates to enroll in courses without the instructor's permission. You'll notice that they are a few days to a few weeks after the start of class. So winter term begins on April 8th, but the last day to enroll without permission is January, or sorry, January 8th. Yes, January 8th, winter term starts, but the last day to enroll without permission from the professor is January 22nd. If you have permission from the professor and you missed this deadline, that's fine. You have until January 31st to enroll. For winter late term, similar thing. The term begins January 22nd, but you have until February 5th to enroll even without the instruction from the, the, the permission from the professor. If you do have that permission, you can enroll right up to and including February the 19th. Now, if you're not able to enroll in a course because it's full, because there are restrictions, because there are other problems, start attending class. <laughs> start attending class and, and keeping up with the lecture material because should you miss these deadlines to enroll without permission because the course is still full and another student decide to drop the course on January 23rd or February 6th, you want the prof to know you. You want to be able to say that, hey, professor, I kept up with the work. I've been here every lecture. I know there are spaces now. Uh, may I have permission to enroll in your class? And if they know you, it's more likely they'll say yes. It's not a guarantee that they'll agree, but it's more likely to demonstrate that you're a serious student and that you've kept up with the material and that you're not joining a course three weeks late. And, and now we're busy trying to play catch up. So vitally important to keep those uh, course enrollment dates in mind. Another important date here is the drop deadline. The drop deadline. The drop deadline is the last date that you can drop a course without it appearing on your student record. So it won't show on your transcript when you go to apply for a master's degree, for example. Um, it will be completely removed. For term W courses, that's March 11th. For winter late, it's going to be March 22nd. Um, anything after that, you're entering the course withdrawal period that begins the day after 
the drop deadline and continues into the last date of classes. So for winter late, you're looking at likely April 19th. Um, what a withdrawal means is that a course remains on your record, it stays on the transcript, but you get a W grade on your transcript. All that W indicates is that you withdrew from the course after the official drop deadline. That's it. It doesn't mean that you're a bad, bad student. It doesn't mean that um, you're bad with deadlines because you missed the drop da date. It doesn't mean that it's going to get factored into your GPA or your credits earned. It's just an indication that, hey, something happened this semester. The student wasn't able to drop before the drop deadline, but they dropped it afterwards for whatever reason. Um, gener generally, that's nothing that is judged, um, especially not in the workplace. Um, but if you are planning a, a postgraduate career, then you might want to play with the, uh, to be more careful about the, the drop deadlines and withdrawal periods. You don't want too many W's in those cases. Any course that you want to drop or withdraw from after the withdrawal period would require an academic petition. And should that need arise, come to academic advising, we'll be able to help you with this. Okay, another minute to take a, a screenshot here and we'll move on. Okay. Enrollment confirmation letters. Um, this is sort of what I, I briefly touched based on. For whatever reason, students might need a confirmation that they're enrolled in courses, whether it's to release some finances that your parents saved up, saved up for your education or to um, show proof of enrollment and registration as post-secondary student when you land in Canada. Uh, this might be necessary and useful for you to know. So I'm just leaving it here. Uh, again, from the Registrar's Office website, uh, you go under Academic Program at the top menu and request the letter, okay? Um, there are eight types of undergraduate letters. You might need a simple confirmation letter. You might need something that's modified. Read all of the options carefully and see what works best for your needs if you need a letter from the university. You'll notice also that it's right above where the transfer credit statement can be found. So uh, you'll be able to access that through there as well. The, the Registrar's Office website really does have a, a lot of useful links. Um, all right. And, and here are uh, some useful contacts and URLs if you need any additional support, um, in, including the recruitment and admissions team. If anything happens and you need to provide more documents, uh, to meet your red, your your uh, admissions requirements like English language language tests, what have you, um, or defer your offer of admission, you contact them. For academic advising, you can contact ask at lasonda.yorku.ca. We will be able to support you where it comes to matters of enrollment, not being sure what courses to enroll if in if you have questions about your transfer credit statement and how that applies to your degree program uh, you can reach out to us we'll help out any support in enrolling in actual courses you get an error message check the enrollment q a that's uh we reviewed that page briefly in the presentation uh, there's also a directory of all the different departments. If you need support in a specific course, it's a searchable directory. You click on the link, uh, type in the subject code that you need, you'll get that department's direct email address. For campus-wide uh, contacts, you have York International, of course. They're your, your first stop. Uh, for anything to do with your international needs, including immigration, uh, your study permit. There are certain support systems in place for international students uh, and their unique needs that, that York International will provide. Uh, they're also good with international student finances, so you can reach out to them if you need some help with bursaries or scholarships or awards. Um, then we have two contacts for the registrar's office, their, their main contact page. Um, if you need help with financial services or need to provide any documentation or the university to provide you documents in turn. Uh, and finally, the transfer credit office. 
So I'll leave that open. Uh, I see there have been some questions in the chat, but we'll open it up some more. We have plenty of time uh, to discuss some things. So um, Rudra ask if you can if you can enroll in W classes being a computer science major. Uh, I don't believe so. In, uh, computer science is supposed to be a winter late term. So you'll be looking at WL courses. And I think, uh, I'm not sure Althea can, can confirm that. Uh, Erin asks, when, uh, I asked if you're done with the course enrollment, we got an email with the package of enrollment. Basically, you have to follow the steps. Yes, yeah. Uh, the enrollment instructions are all in the package. Follow the steps that are outlined. Uh, any courses that are uh, described there that you need to take, enroll in those, prioritize the major courses, and then you can kind of build the other stuff around them. So if you're a computer science major, take the EECS courses first, register to those first. Then check out which math courses fit within the timetable that you created already. Um, and that way you're able to make sure that you can advance the, the, the critical major requirements with the, the supporting stuff that you still need to for your major uh, kind of falling into place after that. Brilliant. Any other questions? Do we want to look at financial? Uh, let, let's take a look at, at some financial stuff because I think uh, I think that that's on a lot of people of people's minds. Um, the main financial services website is sfs.yorku.ca, and you should be able to see the whole screen, right? Can I have a thumbs up if you can see the website? I'm not stuck on the presentation. All right, thank you guys. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you. Um, sfs.yorku.ca. That's the main financial services website. Your student account can be found here. So this is where you check your statements, see how much is due. Uh, that's also where I pulled all the when and how to pay information. Um, scholarships, awards, and bursaries here. Uh, there should be something here specifically for international students, uh, funding for international students right there. Okay, so you can take a look at the options there. You'll need to uh, build your financial profile and then look at those opportunities financial aid, likewise, uh, all the information that you need for international students to build your financial profile, you can find here, um, and then your fee structures through here. But refunds is what the, the question was before. Um, we'll click on the refund tables, and then unfortunately the, the summer is still up, so switch to the fall winter refund tables. And you'll see exactly how that works. Basically, up until and including the week after uh, the courses begin, you're entitled to 100% tuition refund. Okay, So that's January 14th. If you drop the course in the a W term co course up to and including January 14th, or a WL course up to and including January 28th, you're entitled to that full refund. Every week thereafter, the refund you're entitled to will be decreased. So every week you'll see it goes down uh, to 80, then 70, then 60% of your tuition, all the way down to um, March, uh, essentially, where you can get 10% of your tuition fees back. Uh, it's not nothing, especially considering that the withdrawal period is still there. Um, so you could still get some of that tuition return to be used for the next time that you're enrolled in the course. Um, if you need to make any changes in your timetable, let's say you're enrolled in lab two, um, but some other commitment is coming up that will be standing for the rest of the semester, that happens at the same time as lab two and you need to switch to lab one or lab three, uh, you can do so without being charged extra tuition. You make sure you use the, the transfer a course uh, option on your registration and enrollment module. Okay, transfer a course to switch between sections uh, or labs or tutorials of the same class will not result in being charged tuition a second time. Um, this refund will apply towards the, the second enrollment. Okay, that's a question I'm, I've been getting a lot now uh, as students are, are finalizing their 
fall term enrollment. I think I lost the chat. I don't know if there's more questions. No. Okay. Um, any more questions? I, I don't know if I, we have the actual Q&A thing available here. I'm trying to... Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing it anywhere. On orientation for computer science, since we have to book the tickets accordingly, like if the orientation is a week earlier, or when is the course? Good question. Winter orientation? I am not too sure. Let's see what we can find. I know there's a social orientation, it's called Frost Week. Um, sometimes that does happen uh, in January. New students at Lausanne. Uh, you can probably expect some sort of a session just to go over the important bits here for all the, the winter admits uh, that could be divided by programs. So there might be a session that's specifically targeting computer science students. Uh, Generally, it's it's more ge general uh, for, for all the students at Lausanne to have their orientation session together. Let's see. Lausanne uh, essentially the time to enroll. Yeah, so York International uh, has a, a calendar. Thank you, Rudra. Uh, you found a good one there. Uh, York International Winter Orientation. Yeah, here's the page there. So that's for international students. Uh, here's the new student page from Lassonde directly. So anything to do with your faculty at Lassonde or with your major will appear on the Lassonde web page. Uh, there are also campus-wide orientations that are uh, organized by your college and by your federation of students. Um, anything that's gonna take place in the winter will also be on this website. So expect some stuff to happen probably before the start of term, uh, especially if you're a winter late uh, student. But yes, we, we won't just throw you in the deep end in the Canadian winter um, to begin your, your, uh, your courses without any orientation or guidance. So something will happen before classes start. And I just see that I, I sent my the links to a direct message to a student. So here they are again. Maine York University orientation, Lassonde orientation new students page, and uh, the York International specific event on, oh, well, in January. All right, so um, the presentation is over. You can definitely keep asking questions. I can kind of improvise a few additional points that you might find useful or interesting. Uh, interesting, probably not, but useful for sure. Uh, let's take a look at that registrar's office website again. Uh, enroll under enroll in courses, you'll be able to find an undergraduate re enrollment and registration guide. If anything is unclear in the documents that we provided and the instructions that we provided at Lassonde, you can find some more detailed information on how to register for courses through this page, including what we went over, how to navigate the, the York University courses website, uh, a breakdown of what the course code actually is. Um, by the way, if you need help enrolling in courses, don't give us just the catalog number. It's not really useful. There's nothing on here to indicate what course you're actually trying to register to. So this would be the format that we prefer. Uh, faculty code, department code, course number, and credit value. Uh, Lausanne would be LE slash EECS 1012 three credits, section B tutorial seven or lab seven, right? So, so that's sort of how we make sense uh, of, of what you need and, and we're able to help you better. Um, you can see here, step five, I'm skipping a little bit on how to add drop transfer or exchange courses. Maybe we'll see more detailed on what the REN looks like through here, but I don't see that you do. 
Yes, the, the presentation will be is being recorded right now and will be updated to York International's website. So you'll have uh, the ability to go back and, and revisit this. So four options, you'll get four buttons on the registration and enrollment module. You can add a course, drop a course, transfer a course. This is what I mentioned. If you want to switch between sections, labs, or tutorials of the same course, you use the transfer a course function. Exchange a course is if you want to switch one course for the other. What makes these special is that they don't drop your current enrollment unless there's already room available in the enrollment that you want. That's the benefit of using transfer or exchange a course rather than dropping the course that you're already in and then registering in something new. If you drop first and then register, there's no guarantee in, in the spot that you just dropped. Somebody else might have taken it. It's a live system, it won't wait, okay? But if you use the transfer or exchange a course feature, what happens is that uh, your course will be, you, you, the system will check to see if there are spaces available in your target course, enroll you in that, and then only then drop the course that you're already registered in. If you're, there are no spaces available in the new course, you keep your enrollment. Your space is secure. You stay in your class. You don't lose your seat. So these are vitally important to make sure that you don't lose spaces in courses that you need. Um, Rudra is asking if there are any, that there are no science breadth courses available in winter late term. What do we do? Um, so you can focus on your, on your required credits, right? So your, your major courses, you can focus a little bit on what's going on here. All right, focus on your required courses, focus on the maths. I think some foundational sciences have to be offered in winter late, but if that doesn't work out um, and, and you don't have a full course load, you're probably looking at term W courses at that point. Yeah, just, just register in term W. We won't stop you from coming to campus, I don't think. And we'll try to access that. Oh, there we go, the course's website. So um, again, we'll go from here and kind of take it step by step. Um, you can search by subject and by term. So we'll do them both. And, and I want you to be able to see just how flexible this, this actually is. Um, you can, once you become more familiar with the university and, and with the courses, there are other parameters that you can search by and limit your searches. Uh, every search goes through the entire catalog and brings up courses that meet your criteria. So let's start by search, search by subject. I wanted to see, I wanted you to see this mechanism. We'll choose fall, winter 23, 24 um, for our recession. Then uh, check out physics. We talked about foundational science or science breadth. So let's take a look at physics, very popular one with our students. Um, we'll open physics 11, 10, 11. Physics 1411, and uh, for my engineering people, Physics 1800. You'll see here, uh, this is the physics for students who intend to continue taking physics. Uh, that's the physics majors ones, and, and there are no sections offered in term W, right? It's only term F, so this isn't an option for us. Eliminate it, we don't need to worry about it. 1411, likewise, no term W or WL. The only section is term F. So if you wanted to take, if you're in computer science and you wanted to take physics in the winter, uh, those aren't good options. Now, engineering has its own physics course. If you're not an engineer, I'm sorry, you can tune out for a minute. Uh, this isn't for you. Physics 1800 is for engineering majors. Um, and you'll see here as we scroll down, there is a winter late section. So this is what you're going to enroll in uh, when you register in the course. Oops, this is behind Passport York. Um, when you register in the course, you choose the lab that works for you. 
Okay, maybe you like Wednesday uh, from 7.30 to 9.30 at night. Uh, that's when you function best. So you take the catalog number. You notice also that uh, there's a tutorial associated with this course for all the students. It's on Fridays at 12.30 to 1.30. Um, and there are lectures as well, three days a week. So you take the catalog number, you drop it into the registration and enrollment module. You'll be registered in your lab in the lecture that the lab is associated with and in the tutorial for the course. Um, let's take a look at chemistry next because somebody said that there are no foundational lab courses in winter late. I want to make sure of that because it doesn't sound right. Term W chemistry 1000. One, um, term W, term W, term W. Look at that. Yeah, no winter late term. Yeah, so in that case, if you want to take chemistry, just take it in term W. That's fine. Um, just keep in mind that you're operating in different term dates. So chemistry is going to be different from your, a lot of your other courses. Um, yeah, so where it comes to refunds, to drop deadlines, the, this is going to be a little bit of an outlier. You need to make sure that you're on campus in the country um, before January 8th so that you can attend class on the first day. Chem 1000, probably going to be the same story, no term W, and no, no W winter late, just term W. So yeah, it should be okay. Um, but for EECS courses, any major courses, don't enroll in term W. Okay. Engineering, you have your chemistry 1100. This one should definitely, oh, no 11, no term WL either. Yeah, so you might just be taking chemistry 1100 in the winter there, uh, in the summer, uh, then you'll have plenty to do in the winter. Don't sweat it too much. Um, you'll be taking a lot of courses uh, if you're an engineering major. Okay, uh, I wanted to show you also how to search for courses by term. So that's kind of to avoid going through every single course and becoming disappointed that it doesn't have a winter late. You can just search for winter late courses. I'll keep the campus blank because only Keel campus offers WL courses, but you see here, those are the only ones that are offered. A bit of a shortcut for you. Um, so if you are an engineering major, you'll be taking, or a computer science major, you'll be taking these courses these courses and these courses, but depending on the specific course checklist that you receive in your email as part of your enrollment package, you'll enroll in those in the winter late term. Okay. Um, And then finally, here's where you see the, the, the plot my timetable. Uh, if you're enrolled in WL courses, this isn't going to work. The system's not that uh, sophisticated. Uh, what you should be using instead is the visual schedule builder. And we'll get, again go back to the registrar's office website. Uh, from enroll in courses, you'll find the visual schedule builder. Um, it's basically a tool to let you visualize your timetable and see it plotted out before you formally enroll in courses. So you again, you, you take the catalog number of a course you want to enroll in, and we'll see Eng 1101 in term one year late. I'll just grab the first one as an example. Select the fall winter session. There we go, select, and there it is. I did not take from effort or, yeah. So there it is. So it, it will show you a visual of what your timetable looks like, um, but it's not a formal enrollment. You still need to take the catalog number to registration and enrollment module to make sure that you actually have spaces in the course. All right, so I will stop the screen share now. Maybe stop the recording also.
Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're just going to wait a few minutes for others to join us, and then we'll get started. While we're waiting for others to join, can I get you guys to message me in the chat and let me know what program you're coming into? All right, I have one for biomedical science. That's awesome. What about the others? What programs are you guys coming into? Statistics, nice. Oh, another for biomed. <laughs> okay. Uh, for computer science, uh, you're actually in the wrong room. Uh, the computer science program is actually from Lausanne School of Engineering. So if you open up, if you click on breakout rooms, you should see a room for Lausanne. That's the one you're going to want to join if you're from computer science. You're welcome. All right, if you're just joining our breakout room, I was just asking everyone to message me in the chat and let me know what program you're coming into. And just a friendly reminder, if you're coming into this breakout room, but your program is computer science, you wanna join the Lassonde uh, breakout room, not the faculty of science breakout room. All right, I think I'll get started and we'll catch others up as they come into the room. Uh, can I get everybody to use the reactions button and just give me a thumbs up or send me a message in the chat and let me know that you can see my screen. I'm currently sharing my screen and it should say building your timetable. All right, I got a couple of thumbs up, that's awesome. All right. So I want to just start off by saying welcome. Um, welcome to York. Welcome to the Faculty of Science. We're so happy to have you guys here. And we hope that as you're starting this journey in your university career, um, we can help give you those little tips that you'll need to actually start off strong. Um, so part of today's uh, meeting, I'm going to go over just a short presentation on how to build your timetable and things you should consider when doing that. And I'm mostly going to leave it up to questions. So if you have any questions, get those prepared. I can address those after the presentation is done. Um, and then we can just have a discussion and answer anything that you guys might want answered. So I just want to do a brief overview, um, just a a couple of things to point out for today. Um, so on our agenda, we're going to, I'm going to just do a brief reminder. Um, we're going to look at the different degree types within the Faculty of Science. We're going to look at program types, GPA requirements, academic year, course planning, course load, building your timetable. So I'm actually going to talk you through the steps on how to build your timetable. And then I'll share a few resources with you um, for after today's uh, meeting so that you can always go back and look at those. Um, so you guys might notice the meeting is being recorded. Um, so I know York International, whenever we have these webinars, they will record these meetings and then upload it to their website. So if you guys ever need to go back and take a look at something we've shared today, you'll have the opportunity to do that. So 
I'm going to go through one of the reminders, probably one of the most important reminders for you guys. If you have been admitted, but you didn't book your enrollment appointment, I want to encourage you to do that as early on as possible. We do still have a lot of spots available. So you can go into your MyFile account, sign in, and then click on book an appointment. Once you do that, if there's no appointment showing on this page that you're on, just click on go to next appointment. Um, so can I just get you guys to either use the reactions button, give me a raised hand, or you can type it in the chat. Let me know if you have been admitted and if you've booked your enrollment appointment. And are you all starting for the winter term? If I can get you all to just use the chat and let me know. It's good to see you again. <laughs> I know one student here at least has already attended their appointment. That's awesome. So hopefully we'll see you there. I know another one has just said they booked theirs. Um, so I hope if you haven't replied to me as yet, I hope you are in the process of booking your appointment if you haven't already done so. Um, so just a friendly reminder to do that. I'm actually going to move on now to the different degree types within the Faculty of Science. And here at York, we have three degree types. We have a Bachelor's of Arts or a BA. We have a Bachelor's of Science or a BSc, and then we also have an International Bachelor's of Science or an IBSc. Now, most of these um, programs, for example, with the Bachelor's of Arts, most programs that have a Bachelor's of Arts will be uh, things like the math program. So things like statistics, mathematics, applied math, those programs have both a BA and a BSc. Most of the science degrees like physics, chemistry, biology, biomedical science, and a few others are classified as a bachelor's of science. Um, for the international bachelor's of science, right now we only have two programs that have that um, classification. One of them is biomedical science and the other one is um, biology. So within the science faculty, you can have the biology and the biomedical program as being either a BSc or an IBSc. Now, the main difference between the Bachelor's of Science and the International Bachelor's of Science is the international component within uh, the IBSc degree. That international component will have a semester where you study abroad, you will have language courses, as well as international content courses, which are mainly based on things like literatures, traditions, and cultures from different regions of the world. So again, the main difference between a BSc and an IBSc is just the international component within the IBSc. So on that note, I want to just move over to the different program types within the Faculty of Science. And under each degree type, you can have different program types. You can have a bachelor's, an honors, and a specialized honors. Usually for a bachelor's, it's three years for a total of 90 credits, while for an honors and a specialized honors, it's usually four years for a total of 120 credits each. You can have different degree types with each program type, but when it comes to areas of study, with a bachelor's and a specialized honors, you're only allowed one major, while for an honors program, you're allowed a major, major minor, and a double major. When it comes to each of these programs, to graduate from these programs, you need to maintain a certain GPA or grade point average. And within a bachelor's, you need to maintain a C average, which is a 4.0. And for an honors and specialized honors, a C plus average or a 5.0. I do want to just uh, let you guys know, you might be seen as saying a C is equivalent to four. Other universities will operate on a 4.0 scale, but at York, a C is only equivalent to a 4.0 because we operate on a 9.0 GPA scale. So for us, an A plus will be equivalent to a nine. That's why for these averages that you see here, a C average is only a 4.0 GPA and a C plus is a 5.0. So I wanna just share with you the conversion chart that we have just to help you understand it a little bit better on how the GPA is broken down. 
So you'll see, as I mentioned before, an A plus will be equivalent to a 9.0 GPA. And it's usually within the 90 to 100% range. And the breakdown goes as follows. You'll have an A, which is an eight, and it's an 80 to an 89. You have a B plus, which is a seven, 75 to 79%. A B is a six where you have 70 to 74% and so on. So this is actually available to all students on the York website. If you ever wanna calculate your GPA or if you wanna see where you are in terms of your percentages or your letter grade um, equivalent to your GPA point, then you'll be able to see that online. So just something for you to be mindful of. Not necessarily right away once you start your program, but once you started taking courses and you get your grades, it's always a good idea to make sure you keep up to date with the GPA. Now, I want to just transition into looking at the academic year because we're getting closer to the point where you're going to see how to enroll into courses and how courses will fit into each term. So at York, we actually have two academic sessions. We have the fall winter session and we have the summer session. The fall winter session usually runs from September to April, and the summer session will be from May to August. Now, the fall winter session has three types of courses or three terms. You can have the F term, which is from September to December. You can have the winter term from January to April, and then you can have the Y term, which will run from September to April. You also have the summer term, which will run from May to August, where you can have three terms as well. You can have the S1 term from May to June, S2 from July to August, and then SU from May to August. So this is just something for you guys to be mindful of when you're planning your courses. Um, just checking in, are all of you starting for the winter 24 semester? Was that the session you were admitted to? I have one yes. If I can get everybody to just let me know in the chat, are you starting for winter 24? All right, just looking for one more answer. All right, so if you're starting in the winter term, then you will be starting from January. So you'll notice the winter term or the W term makes up a part of the fall winter session. So you're gonna be starting your courses and when you're adding courses, you'll see it says that it's in the W term, which just means it's in the winter semester. So when it comes to planning your courses, it's important to know where you can find your degree requirements. I'm gonna show you guys in a little bit the website for the academic calendar. This is just a screenshot that we've had. It's a little bit outdated, um, but the concept is pretty much the same. The academic calendar is where you'll be able to find your program requirements. So every course that you require for your degree, starting from your first year to your final year will be listed on this website. And an easy way to navigate this website is by going onto the academic calendar website, type in the name of your program, and then you scroll to your appropriate program type. So you can select whether you're in the bachelor's program, the honors program, or the specialized honors program. So this is a great way for you to keep up and keep tracking what courses are required for your degree. So when it comes to enrolling into your courses, and I know um, one of you already had your enrollment appointment, so this might seem like familiar uh, things that I'm going over. Uh, for, for those of you who haven't had your enrollment appointment as yet, but you're getting to that point, uh, you'll be able to take a look at the same material once you go through your enrollment appointment. So we usually give you a breakdown of what each part of the course code means, so you have a better understanding of it when you're adding your courses. So you would have two letters at the beginning of every code. The first two letters will tell you that it's in 
the science faculty. So in this instance, if you see SC, it represents science. So those first two letters will tell you which faculty the course is in. For most students within a science program, you don't only have courses that start with SC, you can also have courses that start with AP, which represents the liberal arts faculty. You can have courses that start with HH, which represent the faculty of health. You can have LE for Lausanne School of Engineering. Rare cases, you'll have FA, which represents fine arts. Now, usually whenever you're adding courses, we always ask you to be mindful of two faculties not to enroll into. And one of those is GL, which represents Glendon. That's our second university campus. And it's usually our bilingual campus. So courses are taught part English, part French. It's also quite a bit of distance away from the Kiel campus. So sometimes if you try to add courses from Glendon, if they happen either right before or right after one of your Kiel campus courses, odds are you're going to be missing one of those classes because you're not going to um, you're not going to have enough commute time to get from one campus to the next. So we always say if you're going to um, enroll, try to avoid enrolling into anything that starts with GL. When it comes to GS, that's the graduate studies faculty. Usually that's meant for any students who are in a graduate program. You're all going to be starting for the undergraduate degree. So you shouldn't be adding anything that starts with GS. That's mainly for people who are doing a master's and a PhD program. Now there's four letters that will follow in that code. Those four letters will tell you the subject. So in this instance, BIOL will represent biology. You can have CHEM for chemistry, MATH for mathematics, and so on. You will have foreign numbers that follow. Those four numbers will tell you the course number. And usually the course number is important because it tells you the year level your course will be. So if something starts with a one, it usually indicates that it's a first year course. The three digits that follow, those are usually just randomized for every course. So they typically don't have a meaning. There's a decimal number you'll see following. That decimal number will represent the number of credits. And oftentimes we'll have students asking, oh, what are credits? What does that mean for us? So usually credits will indicate the number of lecture hours you'll have per week for a course. So anything that's a three credit course usually means you'll have three lecture hours per week for that course. But keep in mind, that doesn't include if a course has labs and it doesn't include um, whether or not it has a tutorial. The credits will just tell you the number of lecture hours you'll have per week. So, for example, courses like biology, chemistry and physics, those may have additional hours aside from the lecture hours. You might also have lab hours and you can also have tutorial hours. So just keep in mind, credits, while it's important, it just tells you the number of lecture hours you'll have per week. And then you'll see a letter that follows in every code. The letter will indicate the section of a course. Now, sections usually just indicate the course is being taught at a different time. It could be taught by a different instructor or it could be held in a different location. The one thing that remains the same when it comes to course sections is the material. So you can have section A, B, C, D, whatever the section is, but the material taught along each of those sections will always be the same for each course. It doesn't change. So for example, you can be in section A for bio 1000 and your friend can be in section B for bio 1000. But if you compare your material or the notes that you have, you will be able to see that you're covering the exact same notes, that you have the same topics that are being taught. So another note on course course load for you guys to all be mindful of. For the fall winter session, you're usually allowed to add up to 30 credits, which is a maximum course load that's considered a full course load. And that would mean you would have 15 credits in the fall term and up to 15 credits in the winter term. So if you're starting for the winter semester, your maximum you're allowed to enroll into is 15 credits. As an international student, usually you have to maintain a minimum of nine credits to be considered full-time. 
but you can take up to a maximum of 15 credits. If you take less than nine credits per semester, you're going to be considered as part-time, which usually for immigration purposes is not allowed. So it's always a good idea for you to be a full-time student, which would mean nine credits or more per term. So that's why you'll see here recommended for first term, you can do nine to 12 credits or up to nine to 15 credits if you want to have the full course load. You also can take a summer session, which is optional for science students. So for the summer session, you can take up to 15 credits. Now, keep in mind, those 15 credits, um, usually, like I said before, you could, that's the full course load. That's the full amount that you can take per semester. What I want you guys to be mindful of, if you ever do take summer courses, just be mindful that the summer is a little bit more compact. So courses are a little bit fast paced compared to a regular semester that you would have. Um, so it's always a good idea to be cautious when adding summer courses, not to necessarily do the full course load. You can if you want to, but try not to overwhelm yourself if you do. All right, I'm just gonna take a brief pause for a minute and just ask if anybody has any questions on anything we just covered up to this point. If not, I'll go ahead and then we can keep all questions for the end. You guys just let me know what you, if you have any questions or comments that you wanna put, you can do so in the chat um, and then we can go ahead. Uh, so I'll ask you to just unmute after the presentation, just because again, we're being, this is just going to be recorded. Um, but if you have any specific questions right now, you can just type them in the chat. And then after the presentation, we'll unmute. Okay, so if you guys do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat for now. We'll go over them in a little bit. Um, so I have one student asking, can I choose four courses? Yep, you can do up to, if you wanna do up to 12 credits in the winter term, that's completely fine. Like I said, the recommended course load is usually nine to 15 credits. So if you wanna do 12 credits, that's completely fine. And then if you wanna do summer credits, you can take six credits if you'd like, that would work. No, so right now the fall semester is already happening uh, for this fall winter session. Well, the fall winter 23, 24 academic session. So because you're starting in the winter term, when you're adding courses, you're only adding for the winter semester. And then when you finish the winter semester, you can take courses in the summer if you'd like. If you don't take courses in the summer, then you go again for the next fall winter academic session. And that's when you start adding courses for fall of 2024. Um, but for now, when you actually enroll, you're gonna be focusing mainly on winter 24 courses. You're welcome. All right, um, so I'm just gonna go ahead for now, if there's no other questions, and we'll talk a little bit about building your timetable. So I'm gonna take you guys through the steps on how to actually put together your timetable. And then what I'll do is navigate to the website and we can all take a look at it there. So it's a little bit easier um, for you to learn how to do it. So what I have on the page right now on the presentation is a screenshot of the Visual Schedule Builder website. This is the tool that you're gonna use to actually put together your schedule to see what it looks like before you actually enroll into your courses. 
And once you go through your enrollment appointment, this is something that we actually talk you through how to do. So once you get your course selection, once you meet with your advisor and you talk about what courses you need to add, you'll be able to use the schedule builder to set up your schedule before you actually enroll. So just a friendly reminder, this website doesn't officially enroll you into classes. It'll just help you to see what your schedule looks like before you officially enroll. For you to officially enroll into classes, you would use a tool called the Registration and Enrollment Module. That's where you would go on to actually add the courses that you've put onto your schedule builder. Now, there's going to be a video on the page for the schedule builder that shows you how to use it. So after your enrollment appointment or even after this presentation later today, if you want, you can go on to the Visual Schedule Builder website and you can take a look at the video just to familiarize yourself with how to use the schedule builder. So when you're ready to actually enroll into your classes, it's going to be a little bit easier for you to do that. All right. So once you're on the Visual Schedule Builder page, just below the video, there should be a red button that will say use the Visual Schedule Builder. Once you click on that, you'll be taken to the welcome page if you're already logged in on your browser with your Passport York account. But if you're not logged in with your Passport York account, it will ask you to log in. Once you do that, you're going to select your academic session which would, in this instance, because you're starting for the winter of 24, you would select fall, winter 23, 24. Step two is usually for you to choose your desired location, for you to choose your campus. I usually recommend when you're on the schedule builder, if you can, try to avoid this step because sometimes it can make the system glitch a little bit. So you can just skip over step two and click on the box where it says enter course. And then that will bring up step three, which is actually putting in the course that you want to add. So you just type in the name of your course. Once you type in the name of your course, you have to click select for it to populate a schedule. Now, once you've clicked select on your visual schedule builder, you'll see a schedule popping up looking like this. The first schedule you'll see here will be the fall term. And then the second schedule you see will be your winter term. When you're on your visual schedule builder and you have the course show up, the first thing I want you to all do is uncheck full classes. That way you only see options that are available to you. And under generated results, the number of options you'll have to go through will be lowered. So you're not going through hundreds of schedules. Now, you'll see on the left of the screen, there's going to be a box, which is the course box. It gives you the terms, sections, and trial classes. The only box you really should be selecting from this area would be the term. So where it says all terms, you would click on that and you get to select whether you want term F or term W. So because you're all adding courses for the winter semester, you wanna select term W when you're adding your courses. So that way the course wouldn't show up in this first schedule, rather it would go to the second schedule. That would be your winter term. The box that you see in the middle of the screen here, where it says the course, the title of the course, the term, the section and the lab number, that will be the course information box. So that's where you'll find the details about the course. So it sometimes tells you who the professor is, it'll give you the room number, um, and it will give you whether or not seats are available. So once you've unchecked full classes, where it says seats, it should be showing available. You shouldn't be seeing anything that says that it's full. You'll also notice there's a little code there that says cat number. The cat number is the unique code you actually use when you're ready to officially enroll. That's how the registration module actually knows which course or what time for a specific course you're selecting. So once you have a schedule put together and you're comfortable with the schedule you have, you can click on registration and enrollment module. That's just below this little box that has the cat number in it. So you click on registration and enrollment module 
and it takes you to a page that looks like this, where it asks you to select your session. So you'll see registration and enrollment, welcome to online registration and enrollment, and then you select your session. So in this instance, because you're all enrolling for winter 24, you would select fall winter 2024, uh, fall winter 2023, 2024, undergraduate students. So once you've selected undergraduate students, um, you would be able to click continue. When you click continue, you're usually given a few questions for you to answer. Now, unless otherwise specified by your advisor, you're going to be adding, uh, when you're selecting honors or bachelors, you're gonna select honors 120 credits. Because whenever you're starting out in your program, you're either starting as a specialized honors student or as an honors student. So you want to make sure in this portion, if you ever have honors or bachelors, that you select honors. You would then be asked about tuition fees. You would select yes, that you're going to make payments and you understand what this means. You then agree to the student code of conduct agreement or the student code of rights and responsibilities. So you would select yes. You would um, select your email. So you look at your preferred email or your York email, whichever one you would like to have emails sent to, that's which one, that's the one you would select. And whichever one you select from this list, you want to ensure that you always keep checking it so that you don't miss any important information being shared with you. You also need to indicate your cell phone number and select your cell phone provider. And once you've done that step, you click continue. Now, once you've selected continue, you would select on, you would select the button here that says add a course. So on this page, you would see a session summary for courses that you're enrolled into. So it'll give you your program and then tell you what you're enrolled in. So if you're just accessing this system, you will notice there's no courses that are added. So what you need to do to actually add a course is select add a course. So there's four buttons there. You select the first one. It'll give you a little box and you'll notice that little box is where you should paste the CAT number. So remember I told you on the visual schedule builder, each course will have a unique CAT number. You're going to copy that CAT number and in the box, once you click on add a course, you would paste the CAT number there and then click add course. Once you click add course, it'll ask you to confirm the course you're trying to add. You would then select yes, and it will tell you course successfully added. Now, once you get that message saying course successfully added, you click on continue, and it will take you to back to the main page where you select add a course again until you've added all of the courses you need to add for that particular semester. So this process, it's a little bit tedious because you have to put together your schedule and then you have to use the registration system to add your course, but it simplifies it so that you actually get to see what your schedule looks like before you actually enroll. One thing I want to point out when you're adding courses, if you don't get the green message saying course successfully added, but rather you get a message saying um, you are unable to add the course, spaces in this course are reserved. If you get a red message saying that, you need to let your advisor know, and then we'll guide you from there what your next steps will be. Most times, if we can give you permission for a course, we will, but if it's something that we're not able to give permission for, we'll ask you to contact the departments directly for the course for them to give you the permission. What you can also get as a message, if you are a transfer credit student, for example, for example, if you've taken courses at another university and then you're coming to York um, and you get transfer credits, sometimes if you're taking upper level credits where you got transfer credits for the prerequisites already, you might get a message saying you don't meet the prerequisites. And that's just because the system doesn't necessarily pick up on transfer credits. So we would have to go in and give you permission for courses. So again, it's a good thing if you get a green message saying course successfully added, but if you get a red message, whether it's saying reserved or you don't meet the prerequisites, 
let your advisor know when you're enrolling so that we can guide you on the next steps. Okay. So I'm going to go over all of this again on the website. I'll show you guys how to use the website actually, and I'll put the links in the chat. Um, but I want to just touch on a few resources before I actually do that. Um, so one of the important things as a student at York, it's important for you to have access to the Important Dates website. And always remember this website is available to you throughout the entire academic year. The Important Dates website will give you dates like when classes will start, when they end, when you have your reading week, when you have your breaks in between the, the year, and it also gives you the add or drop deadlines. It's important to know when the add or drop deadlines are because you want to know when's the last date you can add a course and you want to know when's the last date you can drop a course. When it comes to dropping courses, you need to remember that if you drop a course before the drop deadline or on the drop deadline date, the course will be completely removed from your record. So it doesn't affect your overall grade point average. But if you're unable to drop the course by the drop deadline, and you see you're coming to the words the end of classes, but you're still not doing well in the course, you can use the course withdrawal period. So on the important dates website, the withdrawal period will be listed. And that's usually the date after the drop deadline to the last day of class. And that's where if you drop a course, you'll get a W, which just means you've withdrawn and it doesn't affect your overall grade point average, even though it stays on your record. It doesn't actually give you a letter grade. You'll also have access to the undergraduate enrollment and registration guide. So you'll be able to go on and take a look at this website and see how to actually enroll. So similar to what we were just looking at on the slides. You'll also have access to my online services. This is probably one of the most important websites you'll have as a student because it actually gives you the different um, resources that you need as you're going through your program. So You'll be able to view your full course list to see what courses you've done and the grades you received for those courses. You get to see your grade report decision. And it's important as a student to take responsibility. And at the end of each academic session, you check your grade report decision to see what your GPA is and what your academic decision is. So I can't stress that enough. You want to make sure that you are checking your grade report decision at the end of each academic session. So my online services is the way to do that. You'll have access to different website links through the my online services page. So I'll show you all of that in just a little bit. Um, so I'm just gonna open it up for questions now. Um, I know one student was asking if they can unmute themselves. If you still have a question that you wanna ask by unmuting, feel free to go ahead and do so. Um, but I'm just gonna get the websites prepared so I can share my screen for you guys to see that. Um, so if anybody has questions, please feel free, go ahead and let me know. You can either use the chat or you can uh, you can unmute yourself, whatever you're most comfortable with. All right, I'm not sure if you guys are typing or if you just don't have any questions right now, um, but what I'll do, just in case you know, you're know you trying to think of something that's coming up, I'll just navigate towards the websites that I wanna show you guys um, so you know how to go about accessing uh, the York website, basically. Uh, so one thing I always like to remind students, you can find anything you want on the York website just by typing in um, whatever it is, followed by your queue. Uh, that's an easy way to pull things up on the website. All right, I have one question asking if you have to pay your tuition in full. That's an excellent question, actually. 
Um, so usually when it comes to paying your tuition, you would have different periods by which you can pay. So if you're enrolling for just a winter term, you would pay your tuition fee by January 10th. That's when you should have your fees paid. And if you're enrolling for the fall term, you should have your fees paid by September 10th. Uh, so it's always the 10th of the month that you're starting your program. That's when you would pay your tuition fees by. Um, I'm going to put some information in the chat on how and when to pay. It's a really useful website that the university has uh, that goes over the methods of paying your fees, as well as it gives you a table on how to actually go about paying those fees. So if you take a look at my screen that I'm sharing right now, you'll see that it has um, how and when to pay and it goes over the payment methods. Typically, if you have a bank account in Canada, you can set up online banking, telephone banking, or go in person to your bank and make York University the payee. And then when they ask for the account number, it would be your York student number. If you're an international student and your payments are coming from outside of Canada, then you can wire payments using CIBC or Convira, which was formerly called Western Union. So important for you to be mindful when you're selecting your payments or when you're make, trying to make payments, um, you can definitely go onto this website and you'll see the different uh, due dates by which you can make payments, okay? If you have more questions about paying fees or about anything financially related, we always recommend speaking to financial services. I'll put their contact information in the chat for everyone. You can either email rscheck at yorku.ca or you can go onto the registrar's office website and under their contact button or their contact tab on the website, when you click on it, you'll see a bunch of different ways you can connect with the registrar's office. And it gives you um, information about financial services, about the registrar's office directly. Um, there's information about academic advising as well. All of that is located on this website. So you'll be able to go in and connect with somebody. So I'm going to just put that link in the chat. So if you need to connect at any point with the registrar's office regarding financial matters, you can use one of the methods I put in the chat. All right. Um, so that was a good question. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. Um, right now, what I'll do is actually move over to the registrar's office website. I wanna show you guys what the My Online Services page actually looks like because this is actually a great way for you to get information about your program and about resources that are available to you. So if you scroll down on the Registrar's Office page, you'll see there's a, a link for My Online Services. You can click on that and it gives you a bunch of different websites and different resources that you can use. One of my favorite resources on this page is the new academic and well-being resources because it sort of puts all of the most useful information together in one space so that you can access it. There's things like the Career Center. The Career Center is where you can get career advising. So if you're not sure what to do with your program and you want to speak to somebody about that, the Career Center is a good first place to start. There's also the learning skill services. Probably the most important one you'll have as a university student because they do different workshops throughout the year, usually geared towards things like um, your academic success, managing academic stress, time management, which is important as a university student uh, for you to be mindful of that. There's also um, different workshops on things like decision making. So. A lot of different workshops are put on by learning skill services to give you the little tips and tricks that you need to actually do well in your program. Another good one is student community and leadership development. So getting involved on campus, being mindful of your own well-being, that's a good place for you to get a lot of information from. So I will recommend um, just taking a look at that website and see what's available. 
And New York International will be sending out emails about this throughout the year. And it's about their virtual coffee break. They usually advertise it on campus. Um, it's a good way for you to interact with other international students, some of whom might be in your program, or some might be other students within the university that are in different programs. But it's a way for you to connect with the global community at York. Um, there's also the Writing Center. They do provide one-on-one -on -one support. So if you ever struggle with your writing, whether it comes to lab reports or essays, anything like that, you can visit the Writing Center for one-on-one -on -one support. So again, probably one of my most favorite sections on this page. Um, so definitely take a look at this when you get a chance to. There's other ways you can get in touch with different services on campus. So there's academic advising, career services, libraries, registral services, well, health and well-being services, all of that is available to you as a student. So do take some time and go through this website. There's also the check my grades and progress. So this is the part that I was talking about where you can go on to view a list of all of the courses you've taken and the grades you received for those courses. And you can also see your grade report decision. So remember, good rule of thumb at the end of every academic session, check your grade report decision. It's important for you to know what your academic decision is, whether you're allowed to proceed in your program going forward, or if you um, are continuing in an honors program, if you're on academic warning, if you're required to withdraw, any of those grade report decisions will show up there. So if you take courses in the fall and winter term or just in the winter term, check your grade report decision at the end of the winter semester, and you would select fall winter grade report. If you take courses in the summer, you also get an academic decision at the end of the summer. So you can check your summer grade report. Um, there's other things like manage my enrollment and courses. So a great place for you to see um, or for you to access the registration and enrollment module by clicking on enrolling in classes. When you're going forward in your next academic session, so not your winter term, for your winter term, you're going to have your enrollment date, which is the day you book your enrollment appointment for. But going forward, if you're adding courses for summer or for the next fall winter session, if you want to see when you can start enrolling into classes, you would view your enrollment windows. So that's where you'll be able to see what date you can actually begin enrolling. Now, again, for the winter term, because you're all starting for the winter semester, you're not going to see your en enrollment date right away because it's going to be the date that you've booked your enrollment appointment for. Just a friendly reminder. Um, so you also have access to eClass, which is an online platform where your instructors will post coursework and course material. So once you've enrolled into your classes, as you get closer to the start of term, your instructors will start opening up the e-classes. So you'll be able to go on and access course material there. So again, just a couple of things I pointed out on this website, but you'll notice there's a lot more that I didn't open up or didn't discuss from this page, but there's so much available to you as a student. So I'm gonna put this link in the chat. Feel free to take a look at the website when you get a chance and you can go in and review some of the information that's on there. All right, um, so I'm just gonna go through the Visual Schedule Builder once again, um, just to show you what this website actually looks like. I know we went over it in the slides, um, but I wanna just give you a quick demonstration of what it looks like live. So you'll know how to navigate it once your enrollment time actually comes up. Um, so I'm just going to, if it's okay with everybody, I'm just gonna, quickly go over this. So you'll see here on the screen, it says Visual Schedule Builder. And it's very similar to the screenshot I have on the slide. Um, you'll notice there is the video on how to use the Visual Schedule Builder. So what you would do is you can come back and look at this video later today or going forward in the future if you're not sure how to use the Schedule Builder. This is a good way to look at it and see how to use it. Keep in mind as students, uh, you're going to, whenever you're 
um, planning out your, your schedule and whenever you're building your schedule, it's important for you to remember that the schedule builder doesn't enroll you into your classes. It just helps you to see what your schedule looks like before you actually enroll. So what you're going to do is click on use the visual schedule builder. So that's this big red button that you see at the bottom here. You click on use the schedule builder. And if you're already logged in with your Passport York account, like I am, it actually brought me to the welcome page three. But let's say I wasn't enrolled, at, I wasn't um, logged in at all. It would usually prompt me to log in using my Passport York account. So one thing I want to urge you all to do as students, when you're coming to your enrollment appointment, try to set up your Passport York account before you actually attend your appointment. That way, once you're in the meeting, it's easier for you to go through these steps without having to take time to set up your Passport account there. So what you'll do is select your academic session, which would be fall, winter 23-24, like I said, you can skip over selecting your campus and just go straight to entering your courses. So you can type in the name of your course. So I'm gonna use an example because I think most of you in the room mentioned that you're in biomedical science. So I'm gonna use biology as an example. I will type in B-I-O-L and I'm gonna put in Bio 1000. Now you'll see there's three options that come up. Remember I mentioned when you're selecting courses, you want to avoid anything that starts with GL. So for your biology course, you start with the ones that say SC Bio 1000 and then click select. You'll see it then populate two schedules. The first one will be your fall term. So that's why it says September to December. And the second one will be your winter term from January to April. So you want this biology course in the winter term, it automatically shows up to the fall. So what you want to do on the top left of the screen, you want to select all terms and then select term W. So once you select term W, the course moves over to the winter semester. Now, if we look in the middle of the screen where we have the course information, you'll notice it says seats are full. But you don't want to enroll into something that says it's full. You want to check to make sure that you can actually add the course. So you're going to select uh, full classes and make sure that's unchecked so that you only see the options that are available for you. So once you're on this page you're, and you've unchecked full classes, you can then use the arrows under generated results to move around the course and pick the time that actually works for you. So let's say, for example, you love the time that this class is being offered. You'll click on it and you'll see a red tack comes up. That red tack actually pins the course in place so that you can add other courses onto the schedule without having it affected. Um, so what you can do is type in the name of another course. So let's say you add Chemistry 1000. You would click Select and then on the left again, you would select term W because you'll notice the course automatically showed up in the fall term. But if you're starting for the winter term, you wanna ensure that you add the winter term courses. So you're gonna select term W and the course will move over to the winter. And then you just change the schedule around and find the time that works for you. Now for any chemistry course that you have, you might notice that it has the lectures, the tutorial, and it has a lab. If at any time you're adding a chemistry course, whether it's Chem 1000 or Chem 1001, if you change the schedule and you notice the lab disappears from the course, you're usually not allowed to enroll into Lab 99. Lab 99 is usually for students who have previously done the course and they're retaking it, so they enroll into that one so that they don't um, have to retake the lab. So as new students, you wanna always make sure you have a lab showing up. Uh, so I have a question asking if I would suggest taking morning classes over afternoon or evening ones. Honestly, it for me, it personally doesn't matter what time of day the class is being offered. Um, I'm good with either one of them. And I usually recommend, you know, you take courses at times that are more comfortable to you, but sometimes it's not always your choice as to whether you can have the course in the morning or if you can have it in the afternoon. 
sometimes, for example, with the chemistry course, you might notice there's seven options available for this. But if we change around the time, the only thing that's moving around is the lab. The lecture and the tutorial are being held at that one time. So we're not able to change the lecture and the tutorial. So sometimes you don't really have a choice in terms of what time the class is being offered, if that's the only timing that it's available. Um, for other courses, for example, like the biology, if we um, unpin those, you'll notice it, it moves it around quite a bit. The, while it's just the lab that's moving around for the bio right now, at some point you'll see the lectures will also start moving. Um, so it just it depends on whether or not it's available for multiple sections or not. Um, so just something for you to be mindful of. So either morning or afternoon would be a perfect option. Now, the other thing I wanna also point out on the schedule builder is the cat numbers. So in each part of these course boxes, you not only get the term, whether or not the spaces are available, you'll also get the cat number. The cat number is the unique code you actually use to officially enroll into classes. So what you would do is copy the cat number that you see there and in the registration and enrollment module, once you go on to actually enrolling into your classes, you would open up registration and enrollment. For me, I'm, I'm not a student, so I don't have access to the registration system. As a student, you will. And that's where it comes back to the presentation where you would first select your session and then you go through the questions and then you click on the button that says add a course. So again, the schedule builder just helps you to build your schedule to see what it looks like before you actually enroll. All right, so just something for you guys to be mindful of. I'm gonna put the link for this in the chat. If you guys wanna take maybe a couple of minutes and play around with it for a little bit, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, and if you have questions while you're using it, please feel free to let me know. We can. I can go over anything you want. I can explain something. If you have questions, we can definitely address those while you're in the breakout room. Um, so let me know if you have questions. I'm gonna just pause again for a moment. I'm opening it up to questions. <laughs> All right, I don't see any questions coming through as yet. Um, that's okay. Feel free to post your questions in the chat. Um, but what I'll encourage you guys to all do is click on the link I just put in the chat for the registration and enrollment module and try to use it a little bit. Can you guys just let me know if you've already set up your Passport York account as well? Or if you're having issues setting up your Passport York account, let me know. That's something I can also help you with. Because usually to access any of the York systems like the Visual Schedule Builder or the Registration Module when you're ready to enroll, you have to have your Passport York account set up. So feel free, let me know if you need any help with that. Okay, so if you have a conflict with your courses, usually when it comes to the Visual Schedule Builder, those don't show up. So um, I don't know of any course right now that might be conflicting. I can try to put one up on the Schedule Builder and see if it'll help. Um, but typically if courses overlap, um, then you usually don't see the course anything showing up on your visual schedule builder. So it actually helps you to prevent adding courses that conflict. Um, so you'll notice here uh, for the winter term, usually if courses are overlapping, then you'll get a message saying there are no conflict-free schedules or combinations with selected courses. If this is something that happens to you, what we usually recommend is unpinning classes. So you can do that by clicking on this, where you see for bio, for example, the box that says section M term W, you click on that and then do try all classes. Same thing for chemistry. If you have something that's pinned down, you can do that. Um, if the class is full and we have full classes unchecked, usually no schedule populates. So um, you would have to, if it's a full, you're not able to add it. 
But if it's just a course that's conflicting, once you've unpinned the classes, then you should see a schedule showing up. And then you can just rearrange the schedule based on that. Um, so if you ever have conflicts in your schedule, let your advisor know during your enrollment appointment so that we can help you navigate and clear whatever conflict it is. You're welcome. Do I have any other questions coming through? We have a few more minutes in the breakout room. Um, so feel free to type your question in the chat. Let me know. If you're using the visual schedule builder from the link I put in the chat, let me know how it's going. I'd love to hear from you guys. If you want to unmute yourself or if you want to type it in the chat, feel free to go ahead and do so. All right, one other website I want to also show you guys how to navigate, and I did mention it earlier in the presentation, it's the academic calendar. So the academic calendar is where you will be able to go on and find your course requirements. So one way to find it is typing in academic calendar your queue. And you will see the first link that shows up will say 2023-24 undergraduate academic calendar. You click on that first link and it will bring you to this page where it asks you to type in your program. So you can either do one of two things. You can type in the name of your program specifically. So let's say, for example, you type in biomedical science. You'll see the biomedical science options coming up. Or another way to find it is usually to select faculty of science. And then you'll see all of the different programs offered under Faculty of Science. And then let's say again, Biomedical Science. Oh, whoops, sorry guys. I will start it over <laughs> so I can show you guys how to access it from the beginning. So again, I'm just typing in Academic Calendar York U and I'm clicking on the first link. Uh, I hope you guys can see uh, the page. So I'm type I'm going to select the first link which is 2023-2024 undergraduate academic calendar. Once you click on that, you're then going to uh, either type in the name of your program or you can type you can select your faculty. So if we select the faculty, you see all of the courses that are being offered or all of the programs offered in the Faculty of Science. You can then select biology and then under biology, you can look for biomedical science. So let's say you're in biomedical science in the honors program, you would select that first option that's there. It typically gives you a description of the program, gives you the departments, the university-wide requirements, admission requirements, um, gives you things about GPA, and then it gives you the credit completion requirements. So this is to simply explain it, it's a way for you to see all of the courses that are required for your program. So what you would do is look up the math requirements. So first thing you're going to see here is general education requirements. So you'll see the non-sciences, which for any bachelor's of science program that you're in, you usually have to take non-science requirements. And those are usually 12 credits that are outside of the science faculty. Um, so it's things like anthropology, history, philosophy, anything like that. Um, we do have a specific website for you guys to choose your non-sciences from. So when you meet with your advisor during your enrollment appointment, you'll get a document with the courses you need to take. And there's also going to be a link to the general education page where you'll be able to access the non-science website. Um, so we usually give you all of the information you need and all of the tools you need to actually pick your courses and start your degree. So again, you're going to have under general education, the non-science requirements. You're going to have your math requirements. You'll see different options available for math. You'll see your computer science requirements. And for any bachelor's of science degree you're in or any science program you're in, you do have to take one computer science course. 
you'll also have your foundational sciences. And for most programs, you can choose chemistry, physics. Um, if you're in biomedical science, you have to do chemistry and then you choose either physics or psychology. If you're in, for example, chemistry or if you're in just biology, you would have the option, let's say if you're in biology only, you have the option to choose either chemistry or physics. If you're in math, you get to choose either chemistry, physics, or biology as your foundational science. If you're in the chemistry program, your foundational science is usually physics. Um, so just something for you guys to be mindful of. Uh, you have major requirements. So under major requirements, those will be all of the biology courses you need to take. So if you're in biomedical science, you would get a list of all of the biology courses you need for your degree. Some of them you'll have options to choose from, but others will be mandatory for you to take. You'll have an area called science breadth. Science breadth will be the non-biology science courses you take. Um, so usually you can take science credits, so anything that's not biology based, and we usually give you the list of areas you can choose. There's upper level credits, not something you have to worry about for your first year, because these usually include third and fourth year courses. So anything that's a 3000 or 4000 level course, you'll have courses that are outside of the major. So anything that's not related to your major that you need to take, and then you'll have elective credits, which are usually just additional credits you take to make up your overall credit total that's needed. Um, for most cases, sometimes you can take 21 elective credits or 18 electives, but there's usually no specific number of electives. You just take them as needed. Um, so that's pretty much an overview of the academic calendar. This is for a bachelor's of science program. I want to show you guys an, an example of a program that has a BA or a bachelor's of arts. Um, but I do have a question in the chat asking if it's necessary to take computer science in the first semester or if you can do it in the second semester. For computer science, if you're in, let's say for example, biomedical science, it's always advisable to have it done either in your first or second semester because one of your second year biology courses usually require it as a prerequisite. Um, so either first or second semester for computer science will be fine. All right, so I'm gonna just show you guys the academic calendar for applied math. And I'm using applied math as an example. Um, because yeah, that also applies to math. Uh, so you can do math either in your first or second semester, um, but keep in mind for math, you need six credits of math for your program. So if you take one math course in your first semester, then in your second semester, you can do the other math course. You're welcome. All right, so if we look at the applied math academic calendar, um, we've looked at the bachelors of science from the biomedical science program. So now I'm gonna show you the bachelors of arts program. So if we look at applied math bachelors of arts honors, we'll see the setup for the calendar is pretty much the same, same descriptions. Um, you have university wide requirement, admission requirements and so on. And it does start off with general education, but you'll notice for the BA program, the general education requirements are a little bit different. For gen eds, you'll have 24 credits that need to be completed. And for any BA program, for those 24 credits, it's usually between natural science, social science, modes of reasoning and humanities. Um, so you would take six credits from each of those areas to make up your um, credits. Now, usually you have a minimum of six credits from natural science, humanities, and social science. And then you can do a minimum of six additional credits from humanities, modes of reasoning, natural science, and social science. But you need to ensure that you don't have more than nine credits in Nats, humanities, or social science. Um, so usually we recommend doing natural science, humanities, social science, and modes of reasoning, six credits from each of those areas. That way you have a good balance of courses. Um, so that's the main difference between the BA and the BSc. The gen eds are a little bit different. 
you also have the major requirements. So the major requirements in this case, again, would be the math courses. So all of the math courses that you need will be listed here. And then you have the upper level credit requirement, um, 36 credits at the 3000 or 4000 level. So a little bit different from a bachelor's of science where you usually need 42 credits. Um, there's also the outside of the major credits and then additional elective credits, which will typically uh, be made up of 42 credits because you have 18 credits that are non-math courses. You have nine additional credits that could be from any area. And then you have nine credits of at the 3000 level and six credits at the 4000 level. So electives are a little bit more in most of the math programs. Um, so you have more options that you can use there. So again, I showed you guys the BA and I showed you an example of the BSc programs. So I'm going to put the link for the calendar website in the chat. Uh, you guys can feel free to open it up and save it. So any of the links that I've put in the chat, feel free to open them up and save it so that you can access it uh, for later once you're going back over these websites um, before your enrollment appointment. So I do urge you all, uh, if you have any other questions, we do have about five minutes more in the breakout room. Uh, so please feel free to type your questions in the chat. Let me know if you have any comments, questions, concerns. Okay, I have a student saying when they try to access the math assessment, they were asked for an enrollment key. Um, so I'm gonna show you guys how to access the math information or the math uh, assessment. So usually when you've booked your enrollment appointment, you'll get an email with a bunch of steps that you need to do. Um, one of those is the math assessment before your program, uh, before your enrollment appointment. So to access it, you can either go through the Bethune website. So you can type in Bethune York U. Um, and I'll put the link for the enrollment key in the chat. Uh, give me one moment. But once you're on this page and you look under orientation, you'll see Summer Mathematics Preparation Program. You click on that and you'll see Alex Math Preparation Software. You're going to click on Begin and you will select for Faculty of Science students. Once you click on that, you'll see the enrollment key, which is York Math. So if you're trying to access the registration, not the math assessment, then you can go on to this website and you'll get the enrollment key here. So I'm just gonna copy this and paste it in the chat. Um, so for any student who's trying to do the math assessment, that's how you can access it. So enrollment key for the math assessment will be York Math. All right, do you have any other questions? We have just about three more minutes. Just going to give you guys a chance to ask your questions in the chat. You're welcome. So I know once we head back into the main room, they're actually going to show you guys a few other pre-arrival workshops that are coming up. Um, so you'll be able to get some more information on other workshops that they've prepared before you actually start your program. Um, so if you want to stick around for that, feel free. Um, breakout rooms will be closing shortly. So again, I'm just going to give you guys a chance to ask any last minute questions that you might have. Um, I would love to hear from you guys if you have any questions or comments. You're welcome. I'm glad it was helpful. Um, and I know one of you mentioned that you have your enrollment appointment tomorrow. Uh, you will be getting similar information on how to enroll in that appointment. So it might seem like a bit of a revision. I hope it helped. Um, but if you have any questions during your enrollment, you'll be able to ask more questions there. Um, and just a reminder, if you haven't already booked your enrollment appointment, please do so. And you can do that through your MyFile account. Um, so you would, again, go on to MyFile, 
click on sign in, book an enrollment appointment. And then if you don't see any enrollment appointments showing up, you would click on go to next appointment. Um, so just a friendly reminder, if you're starting for winter, which I believe all of you are, uh, please remember to go ahead and book your appointment if you haven't. And if you already booked your appointment, I will be seeing you there um, because I usually run some of the enrollment appointments. Uh, so again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. We're going to be closing out the breakout rooms in just about a minute or so. Uh, so I would love to hear if you guys have any feedback, if you have any questions, concerns, comments, feel free to post them in the chat. It was nice to meet all of you today, and I know I'll be seeing you all soon in your enrollment appointments if I haven't already met with you. Um, but as international students, just so you're aware of it, I'm usually the international student advisor. And I don't think I've introduced myself at the beginning of this, which is really bad. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> My name's Miranda. So if you guys ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm going to just share our website with you guys um, once more so that you guys are able to access our contact information. Uh, so for Faculty of Science, we have the Academic Advising website. Uh, so I'm putting that in the chat so you'll be able to access our page and connect with us. All right, so it looks like we're getting our little countdown to exit the breakout room. Uh, so you guys can either click on leave room and then leave breakout room to head back into the main room, or you can just wait until they close us out. Okay, sounds good. So really quickly, thank you again for attending the webinar today and for taking your time um, talking to the advisors in your faculty. Hopefully you've gotten all your questions answered uh, regarding your enrollment and just your classes and your program of study. Um, so we do have some upcoming webinars. These are happening for the next um, eight weeks. So please join us to, through all of these. Uh, next week, we will be looking at uh, look ahead at your first year at York. So in this webinar, uh, students will be learning a little bit about what their first year at York will look like. For you, it would be once you get here in the winter term, sort of what is expected for you as a student, what that would look like. Um, and then the week after, on November 1st, we have a financial planning for international students. So this webinar will really um, go into more information regarding sort of the financial expectation of you as an international student here at York. Um, and then just some um, uh, ways of being able to help some of that cost. Again, it's not, it's not, there won't be a lot of information like about scholarships or anything like that, but different ways that you are able to either work on campus or discount, uh, different ways that you're able to help uh, your financial needs. And then I don't believe you are, uh, you're a different faculty, but there is a specific um, pre-arrival webinar for LANPS uh, faculty students. And then this is, this happens every month, so it occurs every uh, once once a month on a Thursday, and it's a YI meetup. So it's a it's just for all of those students who are preparing to come here in the winter term to come and just hang out, do icebreakers, and get to know each other and start building that community uh, before you get here. So if you scan the QR code right there, you should be able to see our um, York International event calendar. And within that, you will be able to find a YI meetup for the month of November. The October one already happened last week, but there will be another one in November. So please join that. And then again, here is the York International Event Calendar for any other, um, all of the pre-arrival webinars are there. So if you want to register for them already, you are able to, they're all open to register. And then for all of the YI meetups as well. Uh, and then here's our, our social media, so you can follow us and get up-to-date information. Uh, do you have any questions other than regarding this or anything else? <laughs>